Hey, how's it going? Welcome to another crime dive. My name is Crystal Sky, and if you're anything like me, you find yourself drawn to true crime cases. I don't know what it is, man. If you like true crime, and you also want to feel better about your makeup skills, because I honestly have no idea what I'm doing, well, you should absolutely like, subscribe, and let's hang out together every Tuesday where I will take a deep dive look into a true crime case while slapping on the old clown paint. So how are y'all doing out there? I hope y'all are ready for today's case, because oh my god, it's a long one. There's a lot to get into. But first, real quick, a couple of uh, quick announcements. So as a reminder, I will not be uploading next week. This is the last case for the month of January. And I don't know if you've noticed, but some months happen to have five Tuesdays in them, and I have decided to take the fifth Tuesday off. Now, I know I didn't upload the, at the beginning of the year, but yeah, I just needed some time to, you know, gather gather some things. We've got some stuff going on right now. And I'm just going to stick to that schedule of every fifth Tuesday I will be taking off. But hopefully what will make up for the fact that I won't be uploading next week is how long this one is. Like, we've got a lot to get into. And just FYI, it is super rainy and gloomy right now. So you might hear some, some ambient weather sounds and some, some splish splash sounds. I always do what I can, but yeah, I I'm not an audio engineer and that's not something I, I focus like a whole lot on. So yeah, and honestly, it's pretty amazing that I'm even able to film this video right now. I've got so much going on right now. I just got a lot of things in the air right now. And yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting. Doing my best to sort of, you know, go with the flow, you know, embrace the chaos a little bit as it were. Kind of saying the litany of fear to myself, you know, I don't know any Dune Raiders out there. There's actually a YouTuber slash Twitch streamer that I watch. I've been watching for years. Danica XIX. And yeah, that's always like her philosophy is like, oh, you gotta, you gotta embrace the chaos and kind of go with it. And that's definitely what I've been trying to do. I am a planner, all right? I gotta have like plans A through Z. I hate when stuff doesn't go as planned. And yeah, that's life, all right? Very rarely do things go just as we planned in life, right? So definitely, definitely doing like some, some learning, you know? But yeah, it is, it is exciting. And you can tell I've been kind of going with the chaos because my skin looks like shiitake. It's really bad. I've got red patches everywhere. Like I break out really bad in like, I don't know. I don't know if it's rosacea or what, but yeah, man, my, my skin does not does not like chaos and I'm definitely doing my best to sort of you know go go with it I also tend to like yeah chew my my fingernails when yeah like I'm stressed or there's just a lot going on and yeah you can tell I have a lot going on because I didn't even get a chance to paint my fingernails so sorry again there's just a lot going on but we're getting through we're getting through all right it's a learning curve and you know while chaotic it's also fun and if you just cannot wait two weeks without hanging out with me I do upload my shorter video series crime Dip every Thursday, same time as these videos, 10 a.m. Pacific Standard Time, where I go ahead and kind of look into more active cases, maybe cases I've stumbled across that I haven't heard of, ongoing cases like trials coming up and stuff, maybe cases that I've heard about that just don't have a lot of information, so I can't really do like a deep, deep dive. So yeah, it's definitely been fun doing two videos a week. Alrighty, well, I think I think that's enough blabbering from me. I think we're ready to, to get into today's case, which is another requested case. Today's case was requested by Becky D. and. And oh my gosh, I hope, I hope you guys are ready to have your blood boiling. This is a very infuriating case and just another example of selfish a-holes just not caring about anyone else but themselves. Today, we will be talking about the case of Laura Ackerson. Have you heard of this case? I did read a book for this case, uh, Bitter Remains by Diane Fanning. And yeah, it, it was an okay book. Um, I kind of wish we got a little bit more into uh, uh, Laura's upbringing and her murderer, her, her ex-husband Grant. Um, it goes a little bit, like a very surface level, like skew of their childhood. But what I did appreciate about this book was it really straightened out a lot of details. If you were to research this case, just going off like newspaper articles and online articles and stuff like that, you would get so many facts 
like twisted and mishmashed. Like I was, I was floored because I had already had like my, my script as it were, like sorted out and ready to go. And then I was like, oh my God, there's a book on this case. Yeah, I'm going to go ahead and get it. I love when cases have books. And then as I started reading it, I had to change more and more and more of my research. Cause I was like, oh my God, so many of these facts, while facts were, you know, like it, like mishmashed and, and misreported and some like little errors here and there. So yeah, if you really want like a full laydown of what happened in this case, I definitely recommend this book or this video. <laughs> And yeah, like I said, I kind of wish we had a little bit more info in like to the upbringing and childhood, but I did appreciate all of the details in the book that kind of straightened out all of the facts that you read about this case in like newspapers and stuff. So disclaimer, there is going to be some, some swearage in here. We've got like a couple F-bombs and stuff. I know you guys usually don't care, but again, you just, you never know, right? So I always give disclaimers. We will also be talking about dismemberment and actually, literally as I'm sitting here saying dismemberment, I just realized all of the cases this month had to do with dismemberment. What the? Like, what? That is really, that's kind of creepy. And yeah, that totally was not meant to happen. My bad. But thankfully we won't be going into like too much graphic detail, right? I think the Joel Guy Jr. one is probably the one with the most detail, I would say. And yeah, man, are you guys, are you guys ready? Get comfy. All right, get comfy, get cozy. I've got the weather as like the perfect sort of like ambient sort of like mood because yeah, this, this case is horrendous. It's awful. And let's, let's go ahead and transition the mood here because I have some thoughts. I have some thoughts on the murderers in this case. This, this case infuriates me. I don't think I've had this much disdain for defendants, maybe since the uh, Angela McNulty case. So yeah, let's let's get into it. So yeah, let's start with Laura. So Laura Jean Ackerson was born April 30th, 1984 in Hastings, Michigan. She was born to Roger and Brenda Ackerson, and she had six siblings, including a sister named Jennifer May Cross, and an older half-brother named Jason, who was her father's son. Now, when Laura was just a toddler, her parents divorced and it is sad it was not a pleasant one it was very tumultuous all the book said was that there was a lot of allegations a lot of finger pointing which led to family members taking sides i don't know if that also involves laura's siblings and apparently th yeah the divorce just just fractured the whole family in 1996 laura and brenda moved to iowa and it is here laura would attend linville sully high school in sully iowa she would graduate in 2003 apparently a year later than she should have and this was due to what was described in the book as quote many disruptions in her home life like I said, the book didn't go into too much detail in her childhood, but apparently it was, yeah, kind of, kind of chaotic. Oh man, I don't know if you guys will hear it on the audio, but it is really storming out there. So it is said even after her parents divorced, Laura did stay in touch with her half-brother Jason. And when he got a place in Youngsville, South Carolina, which was a half hour drive northeast of Raleigh, Laura moved there to join him. She also enrolled in some online classes at Kirkwood Community College. It was said at this point in her life, Laura was looking for a change. Iowa was just sort of like a dead end, offered nothing but, you know, kind of bad times, bad memories, tumultuous relationships, frustrations with her home life. And so Laura decided it was time for a fresh start. So when Jason got this opportunity, she jumped at it. Now she lived in Youngsville with Jason for six months, but then she had to move closer towards Raleigh. There were just not a lot of job opportunities, I think. And I think it was just harder in the smaller rural area for her to get work. So she had to move closer to, you know, the city. In 2004, Laura got a job as a waitress at Applebee's. And here she would meet a very close friend that would be a close friend for the rest of her life, Heidi Schumacher, who was also a waitress. They would both move on to another waitressing gig at Front Row Sports Bar before Heidi left for an insurance gig. Laura ended up graduating from Kirkwood Community College in 2005. And she had an AA degree, not exactly sure what in. I just know it was an associate of the arts degree. And for a time, she did consider being a real estate agent. She even enrolled in this like 75 
25 hour pre licensing course with JY Monk Real Estate Agency, or excuse me, Real Estate School. And this was in the same year she graduated, 2005. But she she realized, like, you know what, I don't really want to do that. What I really want to do is work on my creative side. She was really interested in some of the graphic design courses she had taken at college. That really interested her. And she wanted to try to start her own business using that. And in the meantime, in order to make ends meet, she worked at Bassett Furniture Direct in like sales and helping people with decorating solutions. And in the meantime, Heidi and Laura continued their friendship, staying in touch. Laura ended up very close with Heidi's family. Now in March 2007, Laura met Grant Rufin Hayes III. So in mid-April, Laura had called her brother Jason, just gushing over her new boyfriend. She was so happy and so in love. And, you know, although Jason wished his sister well, he was scared that it was going to end up like her other relationships. It is said apparently Laura didn't have the best luck um, when it came to guys. Um, and it is said she didn't really make the best decisions in relationships. And this was due to like past trauma. And it seemed, you know, due to this trauma and her chaotic upbringing, it kind of left Laura a little naive, maybe even immature, definitely vulnerable in relationships. So yeah, she didn't, unfortunately, didn't make the, the best decisions when it came to picking out guys. And this could explain why at the end of April, on her 23rd birthday, when Laura went to dinner with Heidi, who had just gotten back into town, Laura gushed to her best friend, her and Grant had gotten married. She told her friend Heidi, I got married, surprise! Laura told Heidi that her and Grant, whom Heidi had never met, had exchanged vows in front of a justice of the peace in Raleigh. And that was earlier that very same day. And Grant was also 28 years old at this time. Now, Heidi was, of course, you know a little taken aback, a little shocked and surprised, maybe even a little worried about her friend. But, you know, she congratulated her nonetheless and was like, yeah, go good for you, you know? Now, Grant was performing at the restaurant they were eating at. And after the show, that is when Heidi first met Grant for the first time in the parking lot. And she was pretty underwhelmed. She thought Laura could do much better than him. She did recognize Grant as a musician that her and Laura had seen before she left town. He was performing at the Blue Martini Bar and Lounge on South Wilmington Street. And she knew he was the performer, but had no idea that Laura and him had hooked up. She knew Laura had even spoken with Grant after he performed when they were at dinner the first time they met him. But yeah, she had no idea she had any further contact and had hooked up with him. Now, Grant was a composer and a musician who played all throughout the Raleigh area, and he went by the stage name Grant Hayes. So his actual last name is spelled H-A-Y-E-S. His stage name, his name was spelled H-A-Z-E. So Grant Rufin Hayes III was born on April 30th, 1979. His parents were Patsy Hayes and Grant Rufin Hayes II, who was a minister. He had a sister named Grantina Tina Hayes, and it said Grant was originally from Tennessee. Now, while in high school, it said Grant was, you know, pretty popular he was very charming and could talk to people. Plus the fact that he played the guitar just kind of added to that, you know, cool high school persona that he had going on. Now, it is said starting in his teen years, even while he's still in high school, Grant started playing the local like underground club scenes in Raleigh. I'm not sure when his family moved to North Carolina. I know he's originally from Tennessee. Um, that's why I was saying I wish the book kind of went into a little bit more detail. Grant ended up graduating from Kinston High School in 1997. And when he was 18 years old, he married his first first wife. She was a ballerina named Emily Lubbers. Or maybe it's Lubbers. It's L-U-B-B-E-R-S. How would you pronounce that? Now, Emily moved to Greenville, North Carolina, where she attended school at East Carolina University, and Grant had moved there with her. Now, as Emily was going to school full-time and working full-time, it is said Grant tried to find work, but he was pretty unsuccessful. And I guess he was frustrated at his lack of success and his unemployment. It is said... The real reason Grant couldn't find work was because he thought he was too good for the work that he could find. It sounded like Grant just thought he was too good to take maybe some like minimum wage job, maybe like a waiter job or bartender or something. That was sort of the vibe that I got from what I read. And we'll get into it. Grant is definitely full of himself. Now, not surprisingly, being young and Emily working and going to school and Grant not working, it's not too surprising that trouble soon started cropping up in 
in the marriage, and the relationship quickly dissolved. It is said this separation was pretty hard for Grant when him and Emily finally split up, and it is said he sought out psychiatric treatment because he had fallen into like a deep depression, and he was given medication for depression and bipolar disorder, including lithium. And when Grant and Emily finally broke up, he moved back to Raleigh. Now, because of his father's profession, religion had always played a pretty important role in Grant's life, all right? I mean, dad was a minister, not too surprising, right? He regularly attended church, made prayer like an everyday occurrence, studied the Bible regularly, you know, like it was like an active part of his daily life, all right? That is until 2003. According to a friend, Grant turned this like religious dedication, this religious fervor, into fervor over Tupac Shakur. He learned like all of Tupac's lyrics, became obsessed with him, studying his life, studying his music, you know, listening it to it nonstop, talking about Tupac nonstop. It was said Grant would spend most of his time just talking about Tupac. This is also around the time where Grant started drinking more, started smoking marijuana, and then he started experimenting with cocaine and heroin during this time. Now, it is said throughout this period in his life, Grant was working and did make money and was taking his medications, but I'm not sure what Grant was doing for a living. Maybe he was eking out a living playing like the underground club scenes. I'm not sure. But it is around this time when he's, you know, I guess playing the scenes or something and sort of indulging in all these drugs and stuff and experimenting that Grant took 2CE. I don't know if that's even how you say it. It's written down as like the number 2 and then C-E, dash but it's a synthetic hallucinogen. I've never heard of it. Uh, that kind of stuff has never really been my jam, you know? It is said users of this drug experience more of an intense, like, vivid hallucinations um, compared to like LSD or something. And the effects of this drug can last anywhere from 6 to 10 hours, and it can even alter perception going into the next day. And it is said when Grant tried this drug, he was instantly hooked. He regularly snorted it, and within weeks, a friend of Grant's said that Grant was no longer able to have a, quote, normal business-style conversation. I guess he, like, had these weird delusions of grandeur and just kind of went on these weird ramblings and rantings. Quote, it seemed he'd started a habit of believing the first thing that popped into his head. He'd continued trains of thought to nowhere, and then start a new one in a split second. He had lost something. Something in his mind. Part of him wasn't there anymore. And one night, in late 2006, as he performed somewhere, 22-year-old Laura caught Grant's attention. She attended a few more of his shows, once with Heidi, and it was right after that, when Heidi had left town, that the two ended up in a whirlwind of a relationship. Now, it was said Laura was just, yeah, enamored at first, and she thought the fact that her and Grant shared a birthday, like, I don't know, made it seem like, like, destiny, that they were meant to be together or something, you know? Now, it is said Laura truly believed in Grant's talent and really thought he could make something of himself. All he needed was like a little help in marketing and he could have a super successful musical career. She really believed in him. She actively booked him to various venues, lining up gigs for him. And she booked him through Rare Breed Entertainment Agency, which seemed to have only Grant as their client. And it is said Laura just really encouraged Grant to pursue his music. However, it is said, and we will get into it, Grant certainly did not act like someone who wanted a supportive partner you know, someone who believed in him. He didn't act like that. He just wanted someone that he could control and manipulate. And like with many abusers throughout the relationship, Grant attempted to dominate and control, manipulate Laura, who remember was younger, naive, you know, um, even younger than her, her physical age when we're talking like emotionally, right? And dealing with relationships, almost as if these kind of people seek out those kinds of personalities, right? And those kinds of people. And apparently Laura also suffered with, you know, low self-esteem. She wasn't very confident in herself. So, I mean, come on, man, how many cases have we done where this is the story, right? And... Grant is a user and abuser, man. Apparently, Grant would make just really asinine, wild requests of Laura. Like, he wanted her to tell his fans, like, about their sex life and like, brag about it, brag about the size of his penis. And of course, when Laura was, like, horrified, I was like, what the no, like, I'm not going to do that. Grant said he didn't see what the big deal was and why she had a problem with it. He told her it was obvious that she was, quote, trash because she was a white girl in a relationship with a black man. What an a-hole. This, guys, this asshole, oh my God, because we're already going to cuss, so yeah, I'm just going to say it. he's an asshole. Grant is a fucking loser. 
All right, a loser. A few months after their wedding, Grant asked Laura to be in a polygamous relationship with him. And when she refused, he just cheated on her with a girl named Kristen in December of 2007. So an incident that would sort of foreshadow Grant's problem with anger happened when he had arrived late at a gig one time. He had a gig at Jack Astor's Bar and Grill in Cary, and he was late. And when one of the other musicians, you know, was rightfully so, kind of like giving him shit for it a little bit, it is said Grant pulled a knife on on him. Now, Laura was, of course, she saw this go down and she was horrified that Grant would like go to that. And Grant said that like he was justified in pulling out a knife and threatening the, the musician because the musician had dared say the word fuck to him. And of course, this penchant for violence like did not go away. Like this stuff doesn't just magically go away. So Grant would slip into what he described as quote blackouts or quote lost time. And in the middle of these episodes, all right, it is said he acted very oddly and very violently. Then I guess he would fall asleep into a restless sleep for hours and he would like actively be twitching. You know when like a cat is sleeping and it like twitches a little bit? It said that was Grant, like like he was having very intense like nightmares or dreams or something. It was very weird when I was reading about this. I was like, oh my God, what do you guys think Grant has? Do you know? Another time, I think it was during one of these episodes as well, Grant had taken some cocaine and had just wrote this like long, rambling, nonsensical like autobiography or something. And he had posted it to his MySpace page. Cause we're in early 2000s, MySpace. And then after he'd done that, he had pulled out his air pump BB gun and started shooting at Laura. Now though, you know, this wasn't really causing any physical harm. It still didn't like, still didn't feel good. And it is said, Laura, you know, of course was like begging him to stop, but it is said, Grant just kept shooting and just stared at her with what was described as like an empty expression. He had like dead eyes. It was like no one was home, which is just creepy. Laura eventually just kind of fled the room to get away from it because Grant wasn't stopping. Grant would also go on really weird delusional ramblings to Laura. He told her, all right, he told her he believed that he was a quote, time traveler which is kind of funny considering my shirt. But he, ser like, this is more, you know, serious, of course. He legitimately thought he was a, quote, time traveler. And that, quote, beings from other planets followed him around. And he said these beings often talked to him. He thought that these beings right here, they ran the U.S. government and a government collapse was imminent. He also said, quote, the world will end on December 31st, 2012. And that he needed, quote, to get enough cash to make it on one of those alien ships at the end of the planet. He believed very rich, famous, and necessary necessary individuals would either be in like this elaborate underground system of tunnels or on one of these ships and they would just like watch the world collapse. It was said that these ramblings of Grant sounded like he had maybe like read some Scientology literature or something and had appropriated parts of it. Honestly, especially with the underground tunnels and like the famous people, it makes me think he watched like Kingsman or something. I mean, that is some wild ramblings. Now, you know, it's kind of funny to sit here, right? And be like, oh yeah, look at this guy like believing in beings and stuff. But like, let's, let's kind of like take it more more seriously, can you imagine, you know, imagine you're Laura and you're sitting here, this guy that you're supposed to love and whatnot you're married to, and he's like going on the on this like serious rant. All right, serious rant. Can you imagine someone like sitting you down and having a conversation and be like, dude, I'm a time traveler and these beings, they follow me and, and they tell me stuff. I mean, what would you think? It was said Laura wanted to believe that they were, you know, just kind of, I don't know, jokes or something. She didn't want to think Grant was serious. But it is said when she saw just how, like, serious Grant was when he talked about these things, like, it, it started to worry her. But, you know, remember, because she's very young and naive and doesn't really have, like, a strong sense of self, it was just really easy for Grant to just tear apart Laura and just really get in there. You know the old tale, right? Like, we, we've seen this a billion Million times in these cases, right? And Grant just took full advantage of Laura's weaknesses. And of course, it was even easier for Grant to do this and control and dominate Laura when she became pregnant with their first child. And it was during her second trimester of her pregnancy that Laura found out about Kristen's existence. And after that, Grant just didn't even bother to hide it anymore. He would openly talk on the phone with Kristen when Laura was like right there. He'd openly ask like, you know, Kristen to run off and marry him and have a big old grin on his face and being all flirty with her. Again, this is as like Laura is sitting right there pregnant with his child. And it is said when Laura would try to confront him about his behavior, Grant would just say that he had done nothing wrong. He had asked Laura to be in a polygamous relationship and she had refused. So he didn't see anything wrong with what he was doing. 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. This is just a little sliver of the selfish prick that Grant is. He said he wanted Kristen because she had a, quote, large butt and just would always compare Kristen and Laura. And again, I've said this a few times now, Laura is very naive. She's vulnerable. She has very low self-esteem. And what do you think this did to it, you know? Grant has users and abusers and manipulators do. He attempted to isolate her from her friends and family. He didn't like that Laura was friends with Heidi. And in order to avoid a confrontation with him, Heidi would just secretly go see her friend. Can you imagine that? Having to secretly see one of your best friends because your husband is a controlling, domineering prick. With, it sounds like, a very serious mental illness. Laura would later admit, quote, I allowed myself to be alienated from my friends and family. Everyone I knew was either, quote, too dumb or, quote, too fat or, quote, not good enough to be around us, according to Grant. Projection much? That sounds exactly like Grant, if you ask me. Now, one time in her third trimester. Remember, she's pregnant, okay? Laura was on the phone with Heidi, and Heidi could hear Grant yelling and, and ranting in the background, quote, Heidi's a bad influence on you. I forbid you from seeing her ever again. And apparently, you know, Laura tried to hang up, and Heidi was like, no, please don't hang up, you know, like, begging her, like, please do not, like, hang up on me right now. And in between sobs, Laura was just like, quote, I have to. You know, Heidi did not have a good feeling about this. She was like, no, th there's something not right. I don't have a good feeling. So she drove the 20 minutes to her friend's house, and and when she drove up to the house, she saw a big black sedan with Grant in the passenger side taking off away from the house. And when she went up to the door and knocked, Laura answered it, tears in her eyes, her nose bleeding, looking broken, one of her eyes nearly shut, and the area around it already a deep red. Now, Heidi insisted they call the police, but Laura just said, quote, it's okay, it's okay, I'm not going to do anything. I'm not going to press charges. And, you know, Heidi at least tried persuading her to go to the hospital at least, but Laura refused, saying that everything was fine, and Grant had never done that before. Quote, please, I don't want anybody to know. Which, yeah, I've read is a very common theme with battered spouses, is, yeah, they're, like, embarrassed which, God, our society really sucks. The fact that victims feel that way speaks volumes about our society. You know what I'm saying? Heidi stayed with Laura for about an hour and a half, but still Laura refused medical treatment and refused to call police. And finally, on May 2nd, 2008, Laura gave birth to a son, Grant Ruthen Hayes IV. Now, it was said, especially after giving birth, that Patsy and Grant II were very open and welcoming to Laura, and supposedly they would chastise their son telling him that he had a responsibility to his wife and child. And it is said, unfortunately, Laura never went to her in-laws about any of the problems who she was having with Grant. That is what is reported. And when Grant IV was just a few months old, you know, she wanted to get him immunized. But surprise, surprise, Grant is an anti-vaxxer. He refused, telling her that immunizations give uh, black children a higher chance of autism. Yep, he's an anti-vax idiot. And in the end, even though Laura wanted to get her child immunized, Grant won, as he usually did. Now, Jason didn't even meet his brother-in-law until his nephew was six months old. Unclear if he had met his nephew before that. It is said occasionally Jason would go to like clubs and bars where Grant was performing, but I don't think he had actually met Grant until, yeah, Grant the fourth was six months old. It is said one time when Jason was over, I guess uh, baby Grant was crying and Laura was just sort of like letting him cry. I guess she believed, they said it was like an old wives tale of believing like crying strengthens the baby's lungs. Is that something people really believe? I, I don't know. I guess I could see how someone would believe that. That just sounds really goofy to me. But she was letting, you know, the baby cry. And apparently the longer this went on, the more irritated and agitated Grant became. And finally he snapped at Laura, quote, shut him up, whatever it takes. And apparently Jason, like seeing how, you know, irritated and angry Grant was getting, decided to just kind of take him outside and sort of talk him down. And he was able to talk Grant down and Grant admitted that he was, he was, you know, acting emotionally. Now, it wasn't long after this incident that Laura and Grant would move into another apartment in North Raleigh, which was near where Jason worked. So he was able to see his sister even more. He would, like, come over for lunch and stuff and just really try to stay in contact with his sister, you know? Now, it is said when Jason visited, Grant, you know, didn't socialize, didn't interact with him. He would just shut himself in the back room in the back and only come out to, like, go to the refrigerator or something. One day, Laura had invited Jason over for 
for lunch, right? So he drives over, he knocks on the door, no one's answering, but he can hear an argument happening behind the door. He could hear uh, Grant yelling, quote, he doesn't need to come around. You don't need to be hanging out with him. He's a bad influence. You don't need him in your life. I'm all that you need. And, you know, baby Grant was crying and poor Laura was just in the middle trying to calm Grant down, trying to calm the baby down. And Jason tried knocking and knocking on the sliding glass door even, but like, yeah, no one was answering. So he decided, you know what, I'm just gonna leave and I'll wait for her to call me. Laura didn't call her brother until the next day. And she told her brother that from now on when they hang out, they would have to keep it away, a uh, secret from Grant. You know, he, he couldn't know because he didn't like her hanging with her own family. Abuser 101, right? Isolate. And Jason decided that, you know what, I can see that my sister needs me more than ever. She needs family. She needs some sort of, of anchor. And so, yeah, I will wait for her to contact me and I, I will see her as often as I can because he saw that, you know, she needed someone. And Laura needed someone now more than ever, especially because shocker, Grant didn't help with the baby at all. He shucked all of the parenting onto Laura, big shock. And on the few occasions he did spend time alone with his own son, he always, always had people around. It was said, it was like Grant couldn't have any one-on-one -on -one personal time with his own son. It was very weird. So he always had people around, inviting everyone over to his home. This included other musicians, groupies, drug dealers, pimps. And apparently Grant had no problem just handing the baby over to whoever wanted to hold him. Yeah. Can, these are the kind of people he's he's bringing to his home and then just handing his baby over to them. It is said he would even offered some like ex-felon, current felon or something, like some shady guy godfather status of baby Grant. I don't know. In order to secure some sort of business transaction or something. And it's just... <sighs> I wish I could say I was shocked, but I'm not, right? We've seen this playbook. Playbook of losers and manipulators, which is what Grant is. One evening in the fall of 2008, right? So Grant, Laura, the baby, and eight of Grant's uh, friends all went to a restaurant, all right? And they were sitting out on the patio. And within 30 minutes, Grant had excused himself from the table. Now, as he's he's gone for quite a while, right? And time's ticking by. And so finally, one of his friends was like, you know what? I'm going to go see like what's going on. So he goes to the restaurant. And he goes into the men's restroom where he saw Grant snorting and dealing cocaine out of it. Very classy, right? Getting, selling the, the old coke out of the bathroom. And he was also doing it at the same time. Keep it classy, Grant. Keep it classy. This friend uh, reportedly like turned around, went back outside, sat down next to Laura and said, quote, you should leave Grant and take your son. And he also added, quote, get your boy immunized. He'll be fine. Don't worry. Yeah, this is part of like Grant's little like entourage here. And even he was like, girl, you need to run for the hills. This guy is no good. Because we'll get a little bit into it. Like even Grant's, you know, like posse's little entourage thought Laura was way too good for him. But we know this story, right? It's not easy for someone who's being abused by a domestic partner to just up and leave, right? In February of 2009, get this, even Grant's own family staged what they called an intervention on Laura's behalf. And they had it at Grant's parents' home. Tina, Grant's sister, was also there. And get this, get this, the Hayes were begging Laura to take the baby and leave Grant. This is his parents and his own sister. And they practically like begged Laura to leave him. Grant II told his daughter-in-law that his son had a quote, crazy world takeover plan. He wants to have 50 kids with different women of all races in order to build his empire. Apparently, Grant had told his father that he anticipated to be about 70 years old when his plan would be complete. The Hayes told Laura that Grant believed this was like the ways of building business like back in the old biblical days. And Grant II also warned Laura that his son, quote, is the type of man who will pimp you if he needed to. His own father, guys, his own father is saying this. Amazing. Apparently this whole intervention really opened Laura's eyes to Grant's behavior. Remember, we said Laura is young and naive. I guess he would always provide a party favor, a woman, to keep uh, the host company at like his promotional parties for his recordings or something like that. And Laura hadn't really like thought of it or whatever. And then after this intervention, she kind of looked at that kind of behavior and was like, oh, I see what's going on now. Like I said, like poor Laura, she's just, she's so naive and like wide eyed and innocent, man. Laura's in-laws then gave her Emily's number. Remember Grant's first wife? And urged her to talk to her. And when Emily and Laura spoke, Emily reportedly told Laura, quote, run. 
run as fast as you can. This all seemed to work, and Laura did leave the Hayes home. And she stayed with Heidi's parents for a while. And yes, she did bring the baby. When she returned to Kinston, I guess Tina then took her to a magistrate to file assault charges against Grant. And at the same time, I guess Laura contacted an organization called Safe Alliance, which is a Charlotte-based agency that runs a shelter for, like, abused and battered women and children. And it is said Laura, you know, called this organization and just kind of asked questions on, like, okay, what, what constitutes abuse? What is it? What am I looking for? You know, she was really seeming to gather knowledge. She was asking, hey, is there any hope for me? Can I get out of this? Am I too far gone? And she was, you know, actively seeking out this information. Unfortunately, Laura would never follow through on any of this advice. It is said Laura was just, she was too afraid to break up her family. You know, Laura never had, you know, the, the mother father dynamic, you know, and she really wanted some sort of stable familial life for her children. And I get it. There's a lot. I feel like there's a lot of people who stay in bad relationships because, oh, it's for the kids and I want them to have a mother father figure around. And, you know, as, as we know, right, sometimes that's just not the, the best solution. And this was, you know, on top of everything else we've talked about, this was another reason why Laura was just so hesitant to leave. She just she just wanted to give her children a, a stable family, you know? By the next month in March, apparently Grant's drug use and drinking escalated, partying more and more, as did the time he spent around active felons and criminals. One night, apparently he ran into baby Grant's bedroom where Laura was swinging a baseball bat and he was raging, quote, the aliens were fucking with him. Laura dodged in front of the crib to shield her baby because she's a mother and actually cares about her children. And apparently, you know, thankfully Grant didn't like beat either of them. He just bolted outside with the baseball bat and just kind of ran off and I think there was like some neighbors that had to chase him down or something. Yeah, clearly having some kind of episode, man. Or maybe his mental illness coupled with drugs. There was another incident where when the baby, you know, less than a year old was with Grant and Grant was watching a movie with baby Grant and Laura walked in and whatever movie he was watching had like some pretty graphic, brutal, like sexual assault scene. It was pretty graphic and Laura, you know, wanted to take the baby out of there and Grant wouldn't let her. He told her that Grant the Fourth was his son and her opinion didn't matter. All that mattered was his opinion. It was his son. He knew what to do. Oh, hell no. And it wasn't long after these incidents that Laura brought up possible separation to Grant. Maybe, maybe some spending some time away from each other. Now, Grant did not take kindly to this suggestion because Laura was offering to go stay with her brother, her and the baby to go stay with her brother. And Grant just told her, quote, if you go stay with your brother, I will hunt you down or my goon squad will hunt you down and kill you and Jason too. And even still, Laura was still trying to broach the subject with Grant, but ultimately she decided to not even try to go stay with Jason because his daughter, I think he was also in the middle of a divorce and his daughter was staying with him. And Laura didn't know how serious Grant's threats were, and she didn't want to put her niece in harm's way. And it is after this that Jason stopped contacting Laura altogether and just waited for her to initiate contact. He knew that Grant was especially incensed since she brought up separation and staying with her brother as an alternative. And he didn't want to give Grant any reason to, you know, get set off and give Laura a hard time. So he decided to just be completely hands-off and wait for Laura to come to him. Now, throughout her abusive marriage, Laura did manage to remain friends with Heidi. She met with her as often as she could. And one evening in late March, as Laura and Heidi were talking in a parking lot, Grant pulled up in a car and just started tearing into Laura for continuing to see her friend. He then ranted to both of them, quote, I am powerful enough and I have enough friends that I could have you both killed and no one will know what happened to you. So don't fuck with me. And this experience freaked Heidi out so much that she actually went and got a consent sealed carry permit and like took like firing uh, lessons and stuff. She was really freaked out about Grant and she decided to have a gun on her at whole times. She tried getting Laura to do the same thing, but Laura really didn't like guns. So instead, Heidi got her friend a knife. It was a knife with a rosewood handle and it said Laura kept it on her. Now it was said, all right, as, as time's going on, right? And business venture after business venture and gig after gig dried up. Grant was getting more and more agitated frustrated, angry. I guess there were some nights, right, where he would play like open open mic night gigs, performing for hours for tips. But often he'd come home with little to no money after settling his bar tab for the end of the night. Yeah, he was making enough money to barely cover his bar tab. Now, Grant didn't think he needed to rein in his drinking, though. 
No, 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 no. Grant thought he just needed a new audience. He'd been playing like this college underground like club circuit for many years, but he'd eventually been like pushed out of, of, of the scene, you know? Now, Grant claimed this was due to the fact that someone was trying to kill him, uh, allegedly for his knowledge of and or participation of a murder. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's why Grant couldn't make money with his music. Now, apparently Grant was kind of complaining about this to an acquaintance who happened to live in the U.S. Virgin Islands. It was Joseph Jose Harden, and Jose was a music promoter and agent who lived in St. John. And he thought Grant was, you know, charismatic and had that talent, knew how to work an audience, and he thought he could make something happen with him. So he told Grant, like, hey, you should move down here. I can get you, like, five to six gigs, like, a week. Additionally... Jose said, quote, it's awesome here. No stress, no worries. Kuna Matata, right? And Grant, Grant thought that this was a nice opportunity. So he decided to test the waters and he left his wife and very young baby to go to the U.S. Virgin Islands. And this is when he rebranded himself Grant Hayes, spelling it H-A-Z-E. And it is said while in St. John, Grant did garner a small yet devoted following. And... Within a month of being there, he had a girlfriend. Now, it was that Jose was impressed with Grant, like, not just for his musical ability, but apparently Grant just had a bunch of business ideas that apparently, like, earned revenue. So apparently Grant would sell, like, souvenir t-shirts with, like, his artwork on them. And then he and then he would add, like, St. John USVI to it. And evidently, the shirt sold well. Then, Jose said Grant, quote, manipulated other people to sell them for him, too, which created another stream of revenue. Now, a friend that Grant would make while in St. John, Mark Geerth, I'm gonna assume that's how you say his name, he said he joined Grant in, quote, chasing girls and bobbing pot and cocaine. Mark said that he always felt sorry for Grant because he always seemed, quote, two steps behind the guy who got the prize. Apparently, the song One Believer by John Campbell had a lot of, like, significance and sentimentality to Grant. He thought this song was about him. Apparently, the song is about a man who just envisions stardom and envisions making it and is just pleading for that one person to believe in him that could just open all the doors. And Grant thought he was the protagonist in the song. It meant a lot to him. It said Grant saw himself as, you know, like a lonely outsider whose career just hadn't been as successful as he had hoped. Mark said that Grant would seem very bitter when he talked about other performers and their success, like performers that he had played with and stuff. And he said, like, it was so bitter, it would physically change, change Grant. It would make his heart race and, quote, his face change. Mark believed Grant, quote, was always a little short of what he needed, even and though, quote, he was always striving for success. However, Jose had a different summation of why Grant wasn't finding success. He thought Grant wasn't as successful as he could be because when it came down to it, Grant was just lazy. Big shocker, right? He was just lazy. He didn't want to do any real work. But because of that charm that so many manipulators and abusers have and that Grant possessed, he just kept getting chances. Jose even said, quote, I knew he was manipulating me. He'd say, I need you. Only you can do this. You're special. You're awesome. And I'd fall for it again and again. Now, as Grant is, you know, living it up in St. John, it is said Laura once again tried to leave him. She once again stayed with Heidi's parents, but she wanted to move to Michigan where her father was. She wanted to be near her father. So her and Heidi planned this like massive road trip and it was going to involve staying at Heidi's grandparents' place in Ohio. But shortly before the trip, Laura got super sick. All right. She got pretty ill. And so Heidi took her to Planned Parenthood where Laura found out she was 12 weeks pregnant with her and Grant's second child. And this right here, finding out she was pregnant, made Laura completely reverse her decision on leaving Grant. She no longer wanted to go to Michigan. She now wanted to go to St. John and try to make the relationship with Grant work. She told Jason that she was aware that Grant had a girlfriend down there, but she said that when Grant found out she was pregnant, he promised to break it off. And Laura and baby Grant ended up moving to St. John, and their second child, Gentle Rain, was born two months premature on St. Thomas on August 3rd, 2009. And apparently Gentle would have some pretty serious health problems, um, I believe mainly involving like his kidneys. Now Grant, get this, all right, he explained his second son's name choice in like some, I don't know, online line interview or something and just do so he said quote in my maturity i'm understanding what masculinity is and it's gentle yeah 
what, you're not even a father. You're not a man. You're a loser, Grant. You are a fucking loser. Like, can you believe this fluff? And that wasn't the only fluff in the interview, BT dubs, all right? Like, so he went on about having like this idyllic storybook childhood, describing his mother as a gospel superstar and his father as a minister to this like large LA church. And I guess before this, when he was at, like at shows, all right, before this interview, he would always go on stage and talk about like abuse. He suffered in his childhood, alcoholism running through his family, being abused by his father. And it is said Grant was just so much of a liar and a manipulator that it was hard to believe like what was fact and what was fiction. But as you can guess, right, we know this. We, we know this story. Just because they moved to a new location and have another kid doesn't mean the relationship between Grant and Laura got any better. It just evolved even further. Laura was now twice as stressed with two children to take care of, three if you include Grant. One of her sons had health problems. And and Grant was just determined to not really step up. Big shock. Grant's too much of a loser to do hard work. I told you, I, I hate this guy so much. Him and, yeah, the... We'll get into it. We'll get into it. So... Anyway, because Grant is just being a prick or whatever, and yeah, the, the pressure is mounting, of course, Lauren Grant often argued. Mark lived with the couple for a while, and he said, yeah, they would always argue, and it was usually about money and childcare. Apparently, now that they had two children, Laura wanted a little more financial stability for, for their family. Yeah. And she's just growing more and more frustrated with like Grant's ambitions of being like this rich superstar when it just wasn't happening. She was just growing frustrated with how much Grant was just spending on his career, you know, and not really caring about the family or anything. And it seemed to me the vibe was like, okay, you know, I get it. You know, I, I think you have talent, but look, man, you've been doing it for this long. We have two children now and it's not happening. You need to have some sort of like stable stream of revenue for our family. You know, that was sort of how it seemed like it was, it had gotten to. It just kind of seemed like, you know, she was like, look, this was fine when it was just the two of us, right? But we have kids now. We, we got to think about them. Laura also wanted emotional and familial stability, all right? She knew Grant was still seeing another woman, though she was not clear if this was a new woman or the same woman he had when he first moved to the Virgin Islands. But of course, you know, Grant always brushed aside any and all of Laura's feelings. Like, guys, come on, you know, you know the story, right? To people like Grant, other people don't matter. It's only him. Grant and Grant only. He would always tell Laura that it was his job to make women want to have sex with him. And this was so he could pass them, you know, to his entourage. And he told her this is why he was treated like a celebrity wherever he went. And why everyone just wanted to pay his expenses. Yeah, okay, loser. Now, also part of Grant's imaginary job and career was partying. And of course, he excelled at that. He developed a very intense cocaine addiction, drank and did drugs every single day. And it got to the point, apparently, where I guess Grant was just incapable of even being left alone with the children, which of course left all of the child rearing to Laura. Now, typically, Grant's routine, right, was to perform and party all night, sleep into the next afternoon, get up, maybe make a grocery run or something, eat dinner, and go to work and the cycle would begin all over. Sometimes Grant would even bring people home to the house, like at two, three, four in the morning, waking up Laura and the kids. One time, get this, he brought people over and decided in the middle of the, of the night, it was like two or three in the morning, to have a jam session in the living room. Yeah, yeah, of course this woke up Laura and the kids, but it is said Laura was very kind and accommodating to everybody there. She even cooked for them, you guys. What? And she was just, yeah, a very accommodating host, having way more patience than I would. But it is said, like, yeah, underneath, she was simmering at Grant. She was very angry. And she was just growing more and more tired of Grant's antics. Now, Jose saw how Grant treated Laura, and he just, he didn't get it, man. Like, he saw the same thing that even Laura's friends saw, was just like, dude, he's got this chick who's way out of his league, and he treats her like dirt. I don't get it. Jose thought Laura was a caring, loving, supportive woman. And it is said he just kind of felt helpless when he saw Grant treating her, you know, like shit. And apparently whenever Grant was off partying and doing drugs, he would just tell Laura that he was with Jose because she knew Jose didn't put up with that crap. He hated drugs and that whole scene. And this, of course, would cause poor Jose to be in the middle as Grant would tell him like, hey, you need to alibi me, you know, if Laura asks you where I was. Which is just, I don't know, it's just really scummy. Like, I'm sorry, I don't care if you're like my best friend. Don't involve me in, in your cheating and stuff. Get out of here. But of 
of course, Jose is also in a, in a predicament, right? Because like he's trying to make money off Grant. You know, he's an agent and a manager and he's trying to, you know, get his client work. So yeah, Jose is sort of stuck in the between a rock and a hard place. But as time went on and Jose witnessed more and more of Grant's self-absorbed behavior, he began to just see just how selfish and self-absorbed Grant was. Quote, he was in his own little world. It belonged to him. Everyone else who was there existed for his use. Jose also thought Grant was maybe a little like psychopathic. Just the way that Grant just kind of used people with ease, the way he was able to just zero in on those people that have a lot of empathy and like goodness in them, you know, that people that want to help people. Grant was just so good at zeroing in on those people and just using them without a care in the world. And Jose, you know, the more time he's spending with Grant, the more he's seeing this and he's just like, Damn. Jose also thought, you know, Grant lacked self-awareness. We said this earlier. He thought, you know, Grant was lazy. That's why he wasn't having the the success that he wanted. And rather than have any like, you know, self-awareness and kind of saying like, okay, well, what am I doing wrong? Grant just blamed other people for his problems. It was always, always somebody else's fault. Grant was never at fault. I guess Grant's just the most unlucky guy in the world, I guess. All this bad stuff's happening, you guys, and none of it is his fault. Little Gentle's health problems grew worse and he actually had to have surgery and it was to place a stent between his bladder and his kidney. And remember, he's a little baby. And because of this, like, you know, pretty serious surgery, I would imagine. I mean, it's on a baby. Laura went back to Kinston, North Carolina. North Carolina. I believe it may have been in October. Not sure of the exact time frame here. But she was able to stay in a rental property that Grant's parents had. They had lots and lots of rental properties and all of their family members were staying in various ones. And Laura was able to stay in one and it was located like right behind a daycare center that Grant's parents owned and operated. And in exchange for staying there, she went ahead and like cleaned the daycare at night. And by the end of 2009, in order to make some extra cash, Laura started a freelance graphic design business and she called it Go Fish Graphic Designs. And, you know, she created logos, layouts and printouts and, you know, stuff like that for businesses. Remember, we mentioned this earlier, Laura is really into graphic design. Now, surprisingly, during this time period, even though they were like thousands of miles apart and the relationship wasn't, you know, the best. It is said Laura and Grant stayed in regular contact with each other. And it wasn't long before Grant was telling Laura about a woman. Her name was Amanda. And she was feeding him on top of doing his laundry in exchange for guitar lessons. Mm Mm-hmm. Does this sound sound a little uh, suspicious to you? Grant told Laura that Amanda was a, quote, investor and someone who wanted to back his career. Now, you know, when Laura, of course, questioned, like, is this, you know, more than business? Is this something I need to worry about? Grant said no, she didn't have to worry. Amanda had, quote, saggy breasts, and he was only involved with her, quote, for the betterment of our family situation. Amanda's generous, as long as she doesn't feel you're taking advantage of her. But, you know, Laura was smarter than that, all right? She knew what was really going on. And on December 29th, two. 2009, she just sent, oh, it's so sad. She just sent a pleading email to Grant, begging him to like, stop messing around with Amanda. She knew that they were, you know, more, more than what he was saying. He had a family, like he should just come back and be with his family. And it's just, it's so sad, dude. Laura so badly wants that family unit. And even if it's not the healthiest environment, she just wants to keep her family together. And dude, like, that's... That's very heartbreaking. I've known people like that in my real life, and it's just heartbreaking. But of course, he Grant, Grant didn't care. He didn't care. And in January of 2010, Grant was ready to leave the island, all right? He was ready to come back to the States, but he didn't want to go back to North Carolina and be with his wife and child. No, 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 no. He was following Amanda to New York City. So let's get a little bit into this other woman, all right? Let's... This bitch, all right? Ugh, so many complicated feelings about Amanda. So let's get into her a little bit. So Amanda Perry Smith, other sources said her name was Amanda Perry Tucker, but whatever, was born on April 8th, 1972. Now, her mother was Raytha Fay, and it is said Amanda never knew her father, never even knew who he was. So Raytha had had two children prior to Amanda, so Amanda had 
two older half-siblings. They were two older sisters, Carrie and Dory. Wraith had had them with her first husband. Amanda also had an older half-sibling, a brother named J.C. Tucker, whom Faye had with her second husband. And it is when she's with her second husband that Wraith worked at the Black and White Club, which was located in Farmington, Texas. And this was a brothel. And it is working here as a sex worker where Wraith would conceive Amanda. I think that might be why her second husband left her as well, because he found out she was doing sex work. Now, by the time Amanda had been born, her older half-sister Karen, who was now Karen Barry, was married and had her own children. And it is said Karen actually had a major role in raising her younger half-sister. She was more like a mother to her than a sister, you know? Karen's son, so Amanda's nephew, Dalton, was only two years younger than Amanda, so it is said that aunt and nephew had a pretty close relationship as well. It was more of a brother-sister one. Now, Amanda did not live exclusively with Karen. I just think she kind of spent as much time as she could there. And it is because, as you can guess, Raytha didn't exactly offer the most stable of home life for her child. The family legend said that Raytha was married eight or nine times, and one of these men was an employee at a power plant. And he was especially mean. He often uprooted the family from small town to small town, all throughout New Mexico and Texas. And it is said Amanda dealt with her chaotic home life by, like, retreating into, like, a dream world, an imaginary world, where she was just far away from her home life. She was successful and, like, far away. Amanda was 15 years old when her mother finally divorced the power plant employee, and it is at this time when Amanda and Raytha moved to New Mexico. And it is here in New Mexico where Amanda would meet Scott Elmer, who was 21 years old. Amanda was still 15. Yeah. Creepy, gross, wrong. And before Amanda had her sweet 16, the two were married. And this was in 1987. They had their daughter, Shay Elmer. I'm going to guess that's how you pronounce her name. S-H-A. I don't think it would be Shaw, right? I'm going to assume it's Shay. I've never seen the name Shay spelled like that. So I'm going to guess and hope that it's Shay. And she was born June 7th, 1989. Now, unsurprisingly, marriage didn't last. And when Shay was only a year old, her parents divorced. Apparently, there was a big fight when Amanda wanted to relocate to Texas with her daughter. And eventually, she did win that fight. In Texas, she started dating and before she even graduated high school, married her third husband, an attorney named Ron Adamson. And by the way, all these men are disgusting and gross. Like, married to a high schooler. Like, what are you doing? Now, while they were together, Amanda did get her high school diploma and did take a few courses at the local community college. But after only eight months at college, Amanda and Ron divorced after about two years together. Amanda, along with Shay, then moved in with her sister, Carrie, who was in Lubbock, Texas. And then she and Shay got their own place. Amanda then met a local children's theater director, and she began helping with, like, the productions, specifically the touring productions, so I think she may have traveled with the, the the theater group. And at the same time, she was still taking some college courses. But I think in the end, it just kind of all grew too overwhelming. And really loving theater and like theater life, Amanda dropped out of college and stuck with that. But in 1997, she was introduced to a wealthy entrepreneur. His name was Nikki Smith. And Nikki would become Amanda's third husband on March 19th, 1998. Did I accidentally say Ron was her third? He was her second. Nikki was her third. And when Amanda married Nikki, it transformed her and Shay's lifestyle. And it was living this upper class privileged lifestyle that enabled Amanda to delve into a creative talent that she didn't know she had, painting with acrylics. Specifically, she painted uh, abstracts. But unfortunately for Amanda, this happy ending would not last long. On Memorial Day, May 31st, 2000, not realizing the local lake had been partially drained, Nikki dove into it, not realizing there was only six inches of water. He broke his neck and he became paralyzed from the neck down. His diaphragm was permanently damaged and he would have to depend on a ventilator for the rest of his life. And rather than live like that, Nikki came home, lived his last few days, and died on October 11th, 2000. Now, since Amanda didn't want any part of Nikki's business. She sold her share to Nikki's brother and made some trades to Nikki's adult children, including trading half of Nikki's retirement account for the children's half of the family farmland. And now, having a sizable financial cushion along with property, Amanda decided to dive into acting. She was accepted to a two-year film and television program at a conservatory in New York City. And meanwhile, Raytha stayed at the farmland. It was like in Texas, so she stayed at the property. While Amanda 
uh, headed off to New York City. She would end up bouncing back and forth between her Aunt Karen in Texas and her father in New Mexico. She did not care for New York at all. Now, after graduating, Manda then moved to Los Angeles, where she got some very minor roles as just an extra. You know, an extra are just like the people in the background. That's actually what I'm going to be casting soon. And the, yeah, they don't have lines. Sometimes your face doesn't even get shown fully. It's just like the back of your head, right? And she did get plenty of those kinds of roles. And in movies like The Stepford Wives and shows like The O.C. and The Sopranos. So she did get some some work, but like if you're trying to be an actress, all right, and all you're getting is like extra work, it it ends up not really being worth it, all right? And that's what Amanda encountered. She, it was evident her acting career was never going to be like her name in lights or anything, you know? Because you can per, you can totally make, I think, you know, a comfortable living just being an extra or whatever, you know? But if you're trying to like make it, you know, make it as a star like Amanda was trying to do, it just, it wasn't happening. Um, it didn't help that she was already in her 30s and in Hollywood, the cesspool that it is. Remember, women were not allowed to age. We're supposed to look perfect 24-7 and we're supposed to look 20 years old all of our lives. Meanwhile, men, they can get bald, they can get fat, they can get out of shape, they can do whatever they want and they're fine, right? So it is messed up. It really is. But that's the reality of the industry, right? And Amanda encountered this first hand. She was already seen as like a senior in Hollywood's eyes just for being in her 30s. So with the acting thing not really panning out, Amanda headed back to Texas. And she got a real estate license here, but she wasn't really happy doing that. So she went back to New York City. She finished up a cosmetology license that she had started in Texas and actually managed a salon on the Upper East Side of Manhattan. Is that like the hoity-toity area? But even still doing this, Amanda just wasn't happy. And in January of 2007, she decided to go on vacation. And she decided to go to the U.S. Virgin Islands. She fell in love with St. John and turned her two-week vacation into a six-week one. Must be nice. Can you imagine even having a vacation, much less a two-week one, and then being able to just, like, change it to a six-week one on a whim? Damn, that sounds nice. When Amanda got back to New York, she sold her car, sublet her apartment, put some things in storage, and headed to the Virgin Islands. She first worked as a bartender, then became a gallery director of the Artists Association of St. John. She had lots of plans and ideas that involved, like, teaching painting classes, getting hobbyists along with non-professional artists, like, into, into the scene. And when Amanda saw that she was having a difficult time finding the art supplies she needed on the island, she decided to redesign an unused portion of the gallery space, and she opened up Pirate's Paradise Art Supply, and she stocked it with, you know, high quality brushes, acrylics, watercolors, paper, canvas, like all that stuff that you would need. An October 2007 article was published about her in the Trade Winds, which was a local paper in St. John. And they interviewed Amanda about the art store opening and being like the gallery director. And there was a boyfriend mentioned in this, this article, but it was not Grant. She was described as painting acrylic abstracts, said she was self-taught, described herself as a former actress and transplanted New Yorker. Her her store opened in December of 2007, and early the following year, Amanda went to visit her daughter in New Mexico, who she actually brought back with her on the return trip. She started her junior year in St. John, but when she dropped out of high school, apparently this caused a lot of fights between her and her mother, and they got pretty bad. So she went back to New Mexico, got her GED, and then went back to her mother. And this is when Amanda showed her the business, and she became the manager of the uh, art store. Then, while on a date at the Parrot Club, Amanda saw Grant perform. Six months later, single and lonely. Amanda saw Grant perform again, and they talked after the show. Grant gave her one of his CDs free of charge, and Amanda said she just felt an instant connection with him, and she wanted to get to know him better. So in a ploy to do just that, she pretended to want guitar lessons. And it wasn't long before Grant was spending lots of time with Amanda and her friends. And it is said that the first time they kissed, Amanda actually cut the kiss short and kicked Grant out of her apartment and avoided him for a week, fearing that they were just moving too fast. And she was just really afraid of her intense emotional feelings for Grant. But it wasn't long before she gave in to those feelings. Grant's friends, such as Mark, saw Amanda as a, quote, starry-eyed girl 
groupie. And a lot of them just didn't really like her. Um, they were, I guess, disgusted with the fact that Grant was even cheating with Laura, who they already thought was out of his league. And then you have this chick who they didn't seem to like too much. And it was kind of hard to suss out if they didn't like Amanda because of like her personality or just because, you know, she was like this other woman. But regardless for the reason, they did not like her. But his friends also thought that Grant was obviously just using her, you know? So yeah, of course they didn't say anything or whatever. They just, yeah, saw her as this groupie who Grant was just using and abusing for the moment. Jose didn't like Amanda at all. He couldn't stand her. And that was because even before they even dated or whatever, she displayed jealous behavior. Like whenever another woman would approach Grant, she would just, you know, get really shitty, stare daggers at the woman and just be like a real bitch, which, you know, if you're a musician trying to build a fan base, that's going to include women. Like that's not good. Right. And Jose, he saw this and he did not like this behavior at all. And one time when he went off on her, Grant threatened to kill Jose if he ever spoke to Amanda like that again. Now, Shay met Grant when he walked into the art store. He needed, I don't know, some sort of sketch pad for some like artistic project he was doing. And at that point when she helped him, she had no idea that her mother and Grant were involved. She actually didn't find out until Thanksgiving 2009. And this was after her and Amanda decided to move back to New York City. Apparently one of Amanda's exes on the island was getting kind of like stalkerish and kind of creepy, you know, and the island is like, you know, it's very small. So there was you know, not a lot of places to hide from him. So it was just time to get out of there. And by New Year's Eve of that year, 2009, Amanda and Shay were in New York City in Manhattan and Amanda and Grant kept in constant contact. And in their communications, all right, Grant, because let's keep it real, he's a coward and a loser, was trying to get Amanda to give him an invitation to New York without like asking for it. You know what I mean? Like he was trying to get an invite. He would say stuff like, oh, I'd had a chance to go to New York, but I didn't take it. Oh, I toured with Jack Johnson there. I dated Nora Jones there. I worked as a stockbroker making a million dollars a year there. You know, just like any BS that he could spend to get an invite out of Amanda. And finally, he got what he wanted. Amanda invited him to New York. And this was after he told her that her ex was now stalking and harassing him. And on January 26th, 2010, Grant showed up on Amanda and Shay's doorstep. Now, Shay was not aware that her mother had invited Grant. And in the first month he was there, Grant would record a song and he would record it in front of Amanda and her daughter. And he called it Broomstick Writer. It had lyrics that included, quote, I put a price tag on your head. My bullets will get you soon. And other lyrics that really spoke of hatred for Laura. Yeah, this song was all about Laura and it wouldn't be the only one he would write. So the next month in February, all right, he's in New York now and Grant calls Laura and asks if he can take baby Grant. He wanted to use his not even two-year-old son for a like baby gap commercial or photo shoot or something. And of course, Laura was hesitant. And Heidi even told her friend that if she let Grant take her baby, quote, you'll never get him back. But we know the dynamics at play here, right? And... As usual, Grant eventually got his way and he assured Laura that he would only have baby Grant for three days. And finally, on February 18th, Laura let her baby go with his father, who would end up keeping him for 10 days. Now, Shay said when Grant showed up with his son, she was led to believe that they were sort of taking some pressure off of Laura, that she was kind of struggling being a single mother to two young boys, and that Grant had taken his son as a way to alleviate some stress off of Laura. And I'm not sure if this like arrangement arrangement continued or or what? All I know is that by mid-March, Grant had suddenly stopped sending Laura like child support. I don't know if he was sending her some money, probably Amanda's money or what. And Laura had called Jason telling him, quote, Grant kidnapped little Grant. He's in another state and I don't have the money to travel there. On March 29th, Laura sent an official court request pro se, which is without an attorney. And she sent it to Grant demanding the return of their son. Laura wrote the motion that Grant was living in Manhattan, that she was making only $1,200 a month working at Grant's parents' daycare center. So I don't know if she like had more responsibilities and they paid her or what was going on. Maybe she was living in a different place at that time. She was on food stamps and she only had $75 in her savings account. In response, Grant filed his own motions claiming that Laura had no like familiar support or community in Lenore County and only had sporadic income from cleaning his parents' daycare center and doing exotic dancing. This is a theme that will crop up where Grant will accuse Laura 
of just doing all kinds of stuff for like sex and money. It's like an obsession with him. I don't get it. And each one would file motions back and forth with the court, each one accusing the other of, you know, having an unfit character, being an unfit parent. Grant then sent Laura a plane ticket that Amanda bought and told her she could come there and get their son. But she had to drop her suit and like her court motions over in Lenore County. And when Laura refused, they then canceled the ticket. Amanda would later claim that this was not why they had bought the ticket. And the animosity between Laura, Grant, and Amanda with the child custody and all that, it was just ramping up. Grant talked to a North Carolina attorney, Brad Hill, claiming that Laura had used his checking account to pay for a subscription to the website Sugar Daddies, that she was doing sex work and that he was going to call like the FBI on her. And Laura would later admit to maybe some risque posing, posting on the internet, but you know, far from sex work, you know what I mean? And it is said she did have a couple of like, we'd probably refer to it as like maybe like cyber sex or like sexy flirty talk with some men over like online, but she never really followed through with any of this, never met any of the men. So I don't know why Grant is obsessed with Laura being a sex worker, but that is continuously how he would paint her, even to this lawyer that he's talking to, right? And apparently, according to Amanda, Hill just told Grant that, you know, like, I don't know why you're bringing this up because the courts are going to view Laura's supposed sex work in the same light that they're going to view your cohabitation with Amanda. So I don't know why you're even bringing this up. Now, by April, apparently Grant had still not returned baby Grant, but things were, you know, going pretty good for Grant at this time. He had, he had high hopes for his future at this point. He had some like, I don't know, variety show that he did or something. And he thought if he could get discovered or have someone like discovered there, whatever, he would blow up and he'd be on easy street. Like we said, dude, Grant has a lot of delusions of grandeur. And then in April, instead of returning his son like he had promised Laura, Grant took baby Grant to Las Vegas with him and Amanda, along with Shay and a man named Paul Hutchins, who Grant described as like a former manager. And on April 10th, 2010, Grant and Amanda got married in Las Vegas. Now you're probably wondering like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I thought Grant and Laura were married. Well, Grant Grant sent photos of his little Vegas wedding with Amanda and their baby to, to Laura, right? And like, he told her like, ah, ha, ha, like, screw you. We were never actually married because I never signed like the marriage certificate or some document that he needed to sign to like, you know, finalize it and make it legal. And it said Laura was completely, you know, blown away. And she went and dug out like their certificate or the paperwork or something and was stunned to see that he was right. He had never signed it. So technically in the eyes of the law, Laura and Grant were never married, but now he was married to Amanda. Now, it said Shay was not exactly thrilled at her mother's wedding, all right? She wasn't the biggest fan of Grant. Grant just kind of treated her like a stupid kid because, you know, she was like in her early 20s or 20 or something like that. And Grant would just treat her like a kid and like talk down to her and stuff when, you know, as we know, as we've discussed, like Grant's really the dumbass here. And at the ceremony, apparently Shay did warn Grant that he better not hurt her mother. And this was the start of the nasty, bitter custody battle between Grant, Laura, and now Amanda. On April 29th, Laura's sister, Jennifer, spoke with her sister online. I think they might have uh, messaged each other. And, you know, Jennifer asked how her sister was doing, and Laura responded, quote, terrible, but wonderful, too. Jennifer had asked about her baby, Grant IV, and Laura had said, quote, his dad and I just broke up, and he got married right away, and little G... Grant the Fourth is in New York with them, and we are in the middle of this ugly custody battle. His lady is a movie star. Sigh, lol. And oh, if Laura only knew, girl, Laura, Amanda is far from a movie star, all right? She was an extra. And it is around this exact same time that Grant and Amanda towing baby Grant, headed to Kinston. Apparently, Grant wanted to celebrate his second son's birthday at his parents' house. And, okay, Dude, get this. He gave his mom permission to invite Laura as long as she promised, quote, not to make a scene. Dude, this guy, like, I hate, oh, I hate this guy so much. Laura went. She was just thrilled to finally see her son, but she was disappointed Grant would not allow any one-on-one -on -one time with them. And then, I don't know if it was like, right after this, like right before they went to North Carolina. I was so confused on, on that detail. Like there's like some little specifics that weren't really like talked about even in the book. But I do know, 
I think it's around this time period, Grant filed an ex parte motion with a judge, Judge Les Turner, and Grant said that Laura was an unfit mother. And an ex parte motion apparently refers to the fact that the other party does, does not physically show up and like appear before the judge. Now, Grant was alleging in this motion that Laura had put out a, a Craigslist ad looking for a roommate for no rent. And I guess his lawyer was then insinuating and implying that Laura was, she was doing sex work. She was going to trade housing for sex. Like I said, dude, Grant is like obsessed with Laura being like a sex worker or something. I don't know where it comes from. Grant was also alleging that Laura was having trouble controlling baby Grant's like temper tantrums, which was why his son was with him in New York to begin with. And without any opportunity to fight for herself, Judge Turner took Grant at his word and gave him full temporary emergency custody of the children. Now, Amanda told her daughter that this happened because Gentle needed like a serious kidney surgery and Laura was preventing that or something like that. And that's where, that, and that's why Shay thought the custody arrangement had changed. Amanda, Grant, and baby Grant, I guess, then returned to New York. And two weeks later, I guess the whole blended family moved down to an apartment in Raleigh with, of course, Amanda paying cash for it, the furniture, and a new car for them because she the only one having any money at this point, right? And on June 15th, Laura was served with the ex parte motion. And when she was served with the document, police immediately took Gentle out of her car. And I guess Grant and Amanda were there because they said they like placed the baby in Grant's arms. And I was a little confused on this because Amanda said that Gentle cried the whole way back to New York. So I don't know if this was maybe in that two week period where they moved to North Carolina. Not too sure. But Gentle was not happy about being being removed from his mother's custody. On the 25th of that same month, in June, Laura met with an attorney, John Sargent, and she finally got her day in court. And now Judge Beth Heath had to decide whether to continue this emergency custody arrangement or do something else. Now to Judge Heath, Laura seemed unstable because I guess at that point she had no permanent place to live. I'm not sure what her living situation was. And she was unemployed at that point. But because Laura was alleging that Grant still used drugs and stuff and was like unsafe and had an unsafe environment, Judge Heath decided in a compromise that the boys would stay with Grant and Amanda during the week, and then during the weekend, they would be with Laura. They would make the custody exchange in a public place in Wilson, which was exactly halfway between their two apartments. And the agreement also stipulated that Gentle would have his kidney surgery ASAP. So we know how uh, Grant was alleging it was because of Laura that the surgery hadn't happened yet. Big shock. We said earlier, right? Grant's an anti-vax moron. It was because of Grant that the surgery hadn't happened yet. So he was alleging Laura wanted a second opinion. But in reality, he wanted to go to like some holistic doctor and do some sort of, I don't know, like ritual or, or something that didn't involve surgery at all. And thankfully with this custody agreement that like Judge Heath ordered that, you know, Gentle would go to a hospital and have the surgery as normal. Now it was said Laura agreed to this arrangement for a couple of reasons. One, Gentle's medical care provider was in Cary, which was closer to where Amanda and Grant were. She was about to start a new job that she would have to work during the week anyway. Plus, Grant's, you know, quote unquote career at a, as a musician meant that most of his gigs were on the weekend anyway. So th that was a couple of reasons why she just agreed to do this arrangement in the first place. Neither of them could get a passport for their children or take them out of the state of North Carolina, according to this agreement. And because of the accusations that both of them had lobbed at one another, Judge Heath also ordered that each of them would be psychologically evaluated and Grant would have to foot the bill. The order was filed and signed on June 29th. And and a forensic psychologist, Dr. Ginger Calloway, was then assigned to the couple. Now, as Gentle had his surgery and recovered in the hospital, Laura was there every day taking care of him, of course. And it is here, I believe it is here, where Amanda and Laura would have their first face-to-face -face interaction, their first meetup. Amanda told her, quote, things will get better as time goes on. But Laura reportedly just told her, quote, you still don't know Grant. At this point, Laura could really see Grant for what he was, you know, the user and abuser that he was. She understood, like, she had been in an abusive relationship and all that. And she could see the same thing happening to Amanda. Now, every Friday at 5 p.m., the couple would meet in Wilson at a Sheets gas station parking lot and make the custody exchange. Sometimes they'd meet up at Monkey Joe's, which was like, like an indoor, like kids playground, like thing for kids. And Grant's friend was a manager there, Lauren Harris. And she would always let Grant's kids in without paying. Lauren said Grant would take his boys into Monkey Joe's almost every day and would actively play with them. And yeah, seemed to have a good time with them. Meanwhile, when Laura had the boys on the weekend, she would take them to like nature 
parks and the playground. We'd do arts and crafts things with them. And one night of each visit was deemed pizza night where they'd make their own little pizzas and put them in the oven. And Laura really took advantage of any time that she had with her boys. After the initial June court ruling, Laura enrolled in online classes at Lenore Community College, including classes in early childhood education. Another article said that she was taking courses at Pitt Community College. Maybe it was both. It is said that Laura, you know, toyed with the idea of possibly opening up her own daycare. Maybe she saw Grant's parents doing it and thought, you know, that was kind of up her alley. She wanted to offer like organic food and a bunch of activities for children. And around this time, she also got a job at Health Habit Natural Food Store. She began attending the local church, Grace Fellowship Church, in Kinston and moved into her own apartment in downtown Kinston. Now, according to friends, Laura thought things were... They were shaping up. Things were getting better. Grant and she were due back in court where Laura was going to ask for joint custody. And her friend said that she thought she had a pretty good chance, but with all the progress she had made and stuff, and Laura told Heidi about her plans to go for full custody. Now, Heidi at this time was uh, obtaining her master's degree in criminal justice, and Heidi gave her friend some advice and was like, hey, you should record every single interaction with Grant and Amanda, write it down, recorded on audio, video, whatever, because he's not going to make this easy on you. And since Grant was making some pretty wild accusations about Laura, not just that she was doing sex work, but like, I don't know, he would accuse her of like making gentle sick. Like remember, Grant is an anti-vax moron, and he thought it was somehow Laura's fault that gentle had been born with health problems. So he was always accusing her of like making the kids sick, poisoning them and stuff. So Heidi was like, you need to start writing down these interactions and have them for your case. Quote, every little thing you do with those boys. And that's exactly what Laura did. Also, because they were going to be psychologically evaluated and Laura really wanted Grant to be diagnosed with something, she also started documenting any like strange encounters she had with him. So Laura is relishing this custody agreement right here, right? Things were looking up, but Grant... He was not doing as well. He bitched and complained about it to everyone and anyone. He complained that he couldn't leave the state now and that their apartment in New York, whose lease was already paid up, was just sitting there. Shay was currently living there. But on social media, as it happens so often, it was a different story. Grant's Facebook just plastered pictures of him and the kids and Amanda and they're just a little storybook family and they're so happy. Just a bunch of bull. And whenever his friends would be like, oh, hey, you look so happy. Wait, this isn't the wife we met in the Virgin Islands, right? Grant would just say that Laura was just like a gold digger and had just used him for his money. <laughs> What money, fool? But Amanda was just so much better. And dude, it's just, it's hilarious. But this uh, seemingly okay time would not last. So from the book I read, it looks like the earliest problems that cropped up between Grant and Amanda and Laura started at Gentle's first birthday party. Because remember, it is said that Laura and Amanda actually had a pretty pleasant first interaction at the hospital. But at Gentle's birthday party, Shay did or said something that set Laura off. It was not explained in the book what that was. And Laura reportedly later called up Shay and told her, quote, stop raising my children. They have a mother and a father, and it's not your job to raise them. And can't say I blame Amanda here, but she was pissed off when she found out Laura did this to her daughter. And so she called up Laura and told her, quote, never call my daughter again. And this was just the beginning. So sometime later, Laura emailed Grant and let him know that she was scared Gentle might have croup, which I guess is like an upper airway infection and it blocks breathing and has like a distinctive type of cough to it or something. I'd never heard of this. And I had to look up the pronunciation. It said it was pronounced croup. It's spelled C-R-O-U-P. But you know, she was, she was afraid that Gentle like you know, might get that or something. I think it was like cold season. Plus with Gentle's health problems, really probably not a bad idea to keep an eye on that kind of stuff. And she just sent, I guess, Grant some literature on like what to look out for. And I guess in the email, she was very specific and just said like, hey, just in case, just keep an eye out. You know, his health is already weak. And for whatever reason, this set Amanda off. And she fired off an email back to Laura saying, quote, you are psycho crazy. You don't have anything better to do with your time than research crap on the internet. She told her gentle, quote, didn't have a virus they had a cold. She also accused Laura of always bringing the kids back wet. 
and not drawing them off because she would take them to like a water park or something. During one conversation, Amanda just hung up on Laura, who immediately called her back and told her, quote, you are still new to the situation and like telling her like that was inappropriate. And Amanda, I guess, just shot back at her, quote, I am responsible for your kids now because you are psycho crazy. And it was said Laura was growing increasingly disturbed at Amanda's like jibes about her mental health. And she was like, dude, what the hell is Grant telling this bitch about me? Like, we know Grant. We know that he loves to spend tales. And she was worried that Grant was telling Amanda a whole bunch of misinformation about her. On August 26th, Dr. Calloway had her first meeting with Grant and Laura. And in that session, Grant stated that he and Amanda wanted full custody, that Laura should only have supervised visitation. And Laura said that she thought both parties needed to be involved in her children's upbringing. Grant just said, quote, I think Laura will go away as soon as she sees there's no payday. This is all an act. Again, projection much, bro? Dr. Calloway did note, though, that Laura was also quick to jab right back with, quote, barbed or sharp comments. Now, throughout September, Grant and Amanda continued their passive-aggressive behavior towards Laura. So per the court order, Laura's supposed to have like, I think like daily phone conversations with the boys. And Grant and Amanda were being very malicious compliance about it. All right. So like when Laura called, they would purposely, you know, have the TV going, music going. One time she called at her scheduled time and the boys were eating dinner. Uh, they even got stupid Shay to join in and Shay was like loudly and obnoxiously like playing with them and getting their attention as Laura was trying to have a conversation with them on the phone. And you know, it's already hard to have a conversation with like a little kid on the phone. And these a-holes were just making it so much harder for her. Like what a bunch of children. And Laura documented all of this. She said in her little journal, quote, they act as if I don't exist. It is so discouraging to deal with them with my children. Even if I try to speak with them, I get zero response. She wished, quote, that Grant the Third would value and encourage my times with the boys. He's gotten Amanda so worked up about me that now instead of giving me reports on the kids, she looks at me with disdain. There was one positive interaction between the two women, and Laura wrote it down, quote, Amanda and I were able to talk joyfully about Grant the Fourth and Gentle. But then, on Friday, September 24th, Grant sent Laura a text informing him, this is over the weekend, right? She's on her time, informing her that he was going to pick the boys up on Saturday. Now, Laura ignored this text, and when the time came around that Grant said that he would be there to pick up the kids, she looked at the McDonald's down the street from her house, saw Grant was waiting, and called him and told him like, I'm not going to violate the court order. It says that we're supposed to exchange in Wilson and this is my time with the boys. I'm not going to violate it. And Grant said, no, she didn't have to worry about it. The lawyers already went over this and he took care of it. And the order did say that if he was in Kinston, he could pick him up there. Laura, of course, reviewed the document. There was no such stipulation and told Grant, I'm going to follow the court order to a T. And that is when Grant hung up on her. And then Patsy, being an enabler, left a message on Laura's answering machine begging her to bring the boys over. Or excuse me, it was her voicemail, not answering machine. Duh. But yeah, she, she was trying to beg Laura to bring the boys over. Way to enable your son there, Patsy. Laura just ignored that. She brought the boys back on Sunday at the designated time at the designated spot. But instead of Grant being there, it was Amanda and Shay. Amanda was, quote, visibly angry. Like, she she was shaking. She was very curt and short with Laura. And Laura wrote, quote, this weekend was terrible as far as Grant III is concerned. So I lose until we get to court, I hope. They were going to be in court after the psychological evaluations, but, quote, Grant has been dragging his feet on it forever now. Each one of them had to be interviewed by Dr. Calloway separately, on top of, you know, filling out a bunch of, you know, forms and questionnaires, you know, stuff like that. And Grant was just dragging his feet throughout the whole process, even in paying the doctor. And on top of one-on-one -on -one interviews, Dr. Calloway also needed to observe the boys and how they interacted with their parents at home. And she noted that the, when the boys were with Laura, who's very sweet with them, they were very, they were very low key, very chill. If Grant the Fourth made an aggressive move towards her, uh, his little brother, Laura immediately intervened and shut it down. However, at Grant's, Dr. Calloway noted that the boys' behavior was more violent. They would like smash toy trucks into each other's legs hard enough to leave bruises. And in one of the many documents and questionnaires they had to fill out, Laura did note that she was worried about baby Grant's, quote, aggressive behavior towards her and his use of profanity, along with the fact that he called himself a, quote, bad boy. Yeah. And in October, Amanda learned that she was pregnant with her and Grant's child. And that is when Shay moved to North Carolina in order to help care for her, her mother and her pregnancy. I believe because of Amanda's age, she was actually considered a geriatric pregnancy. And it said Amanda had a pretty rough first trimester. And it is when Shay moves to North Carolina to help care for her mother that she got to see the uh, wacky, unstable side of Grant. He would go on his rantings that we've talked about, right? About aliens and stuff like that in the world ending and Shay was just 
flabbergasted that her mom would put up with this. Like, she always knew her mom was sort of hippy-dippy and kind of out there, but she was like, mom, this is like a whole other level. Like, how can you, like, what? How can you put up with this? And Amanda reportedly just told her daughter, quote, looking at it from his perspective, I can see how it makes sense to him. Okay. And on Sunday, October 24th, an email chain started between Amanda and Laura. And it started after the two had a bad encounter at a uh, drop-off, a custody exchange of the children. So Laura wrote, quote, I understand that you are upset today because I was 15 minutes late. I am sorry for the inconvenience. I would like to address the attitude you have toward me in front of my children. Though I understand that Grant III probably told you I am the worst person in the world. Please understand something from my side of the fence. I am the mother of the two sweet boys who didn't ask to be put through this mess. The last thing they need to see is the person they spend their week with upset at their mommy. If you could please contain yourself in front of them, it would be appreciated. And Amanda just responded, quote, I'm not sure what you're asking about at all. If there were ill feelings over the exchange last Sunday, they were not on this side of the family. And Laura just wrote back, quote, very strange response. I'm talking about the time you yelled over Grant the Fourth's head, quote, you started this outside of Grant the Third's parents' house, for instance. I'm talking about the obvious attitude you have toward me after I followed the court order and made, you guys follow it too. I'm talking about the consistent, openly disrespectful attitude that you have toward me and that you show in front of Grant the Fourth and Gentle. I know you care about them, so please understand, I am their mommy. But if you have something you would like to express to me, I don't mind a bit, as long as they are out of earshot. I think that is completely, totally reasonable, don't you? And the situation would just go on and on and on. Grant told a Facebook friend who asked about Laura, quote, fuck Laura. We split up in the Virgin Islands. I'm surprised you remember her name. No one else did. Figured out she was just using me. Sugar Daddy Grant. She got two kids out of me, but I love them both. This fool. How are you a sugar daddy, bro? You're broke. You're a loser. You don't make money. Like, you gotta have money to be a sugar daddy. But only two days after that Facebook message was sent, on November 3rd, Amanda offered Laura to jo- have Thanksgiving with them. Quote, maybe you can make a dish, a pie, or the turkey if you'd like. You can cook here if you want to come up early. I think the boys would enjoy that. They don't have to know this was happening. But Laura rejected the invitation. Quote, thank you, but until this is actually over, I can't come to your home again. I would love to spend as much time as possible with the boys. But allowing Grant yet another opportunity to accuse me of ludicrous things would go against common sense. And then on the 15th, the ugliness would come out again. Laura had asked Grant and Amanda if she could pick up the boys on Thursday evening. Otherwise, she wouldn't be able to pick them up until 6.30 p.m. on that Friday because she had an appointment with Dr. Calloway. So far, we mentioned this earlier, Laura had done everything that the doctor wanted, the questionnaires and all that stuff. But Grant was dragging his feet. So it really should be no surprise that, of course, Grant and Amanda refused to cooperate with Laura. And this set off another chain of bitter messages between the three with, like, Grant just going on about Amanda's superior mothering ability, what a terrible mother Laura was. Laura accused Grant of purposely dragging this whole thing out, of not doing everything that Dr. Calloway needed him to because he knew that the evaluation wasn't going to go the way he wanted and Laura was going to get more custody. And by the time December came around, Amanda, who had had over $150,000 in her bank account and over $70,000 of jewelry, no longer had any of it. It was said in the course of their relationship, most of her jewelry had been pawned and all of the money had been spent by Grant. He used the money for trips to New York City and Los Angeles, still trying to make it. He was even trying to start his own recording label at this point. And it was also at this month where the credit cards were maxed out. They had no more credit that they could stretch. And Grant was still not altering his lifestyle or habits. Of course not. He's selfish. Why would he? Once again, his pitiful amount that he made with his music was barely enough to cover his bar tab, which of course, of course he was still drinking. I don't know about the drugs though. I was a little confused about that. And Amanda wasn't able to get a job. Not only was she pregnant, but remember, Grant doesn't help with the kids. So now she was stuck taking care of two children while pregnant, like near 40, five days a week. On December 9th, Laura, through her attorney, Sergeant, filed a motion alleging that Grant was in contempt of the order by purposely dragging out the process with Dr. Calloway. Sergeant requested that custody immediately be relinquished back to Laura. Hill, Grant's attorney withdrew from the case. And around Christmas time, Grant had hired William Ford Coley as his attorney. In the end, it was ordered that Grant and Amanda would split the cost of Dr. Calloway. Laura, of course, forked over her portion immediately. Grant did not. And as January of 2011 rolled around, Grant was still giving Laura a hard time about being able to communicate with her sons, still like trying not to follow the order, and just being a general douchewad. He would tell her, quote, we don't bother you when you have the boys. I'd rather not infringe on their time 
time with you. It is good to miss and be missed. He was like, yeah, angry that Laura was following the court order and having her scheduled phone times. Grant accused Laura, of course, of wild things. Accused her of like playing mind games with the boys to quote, antagonize daddy. Makes me wonder, like, what kind of tempers Grant was throwing. We mentioned this earlier. He accused Laura and her reckless behavior of making Gentle sick. That was the reason he was sick. Accused her of making him a scapegoat for all of her problems. And Laura, like, finally responded to all these accusations, because um, this was all, like, via email and text and stuff. And she said, quote, You criticize me constantly, taking a grain of truth and building a pearl of crap around it. I have put up with your need to degrade and manipulate people to feel better about yourself for several years against my better judgment. She demanded that he help pay for the boy's medical insurance, which Grant refused, saying it wasn't worth the money. And he didn't have it anyway, quote, and you want me held in contempt of court for not having more money to pay Callaway? I grew up poor in Kinston and it sucks. My kids would not live that way. This is their only childhood. Grant will be three soon. His whole life has been mommy and daddy fighting. You got some real stuff you need to deal with. You got a raw deal when you were their age and you are trying your damnedest to make sure your kids get one too. That's bad karma, Laura. I was weak and let you intimidate me, exploit my my guilt and hold my failed marriage over my head. One of my biggest mistakes was not showing your hateful, twisted, childish spirit to the door sooner. Can you believe the projection in this fool? I hate this idiot so much. I hate Grant. I wish I could pound his ugly face in. He is such a terrible person inside and out. And Laura just responded, quote, I am literally laughing right now. Thanks. I'm done, Grant. DNR. Do not resuscitate. And when he wouldn't stop messaging her, she finally said, quote, Grant, I've spent too long in conversations like this. Go talk to your wife. And as the new year rolled on, Grant messaged like all of his contacts and stuff on social media, asking them to get rid of any mentions or photos of him that showed him in a light that the court wouldn't favor, you know, partying, doing drugs, and God knows what else. In February, he told a friend that he had some serious problems with the IRS. They were coming after him for his 2009 earnings. And he told his friend that he had serious problems with the custody case as well. That same month, Shay moved out of Amanda's apartment, it is said, at Grant's urging. And she moved into an apartment in the same complex just across the way. And I believe it is also around this time period where more psychological evaluations were, were done on Grant, Amanda, and Laura and like their relationship with the kids. So Dr. Calloway wanted to see how the boys reacted after the parents were with them and then left for a period of time and they were left alone and or with a stranger. And when the parents came back, all right, she wanted to see like how the boys reacted. So during Laura's turn, she first went to the playroom with Grant the fourth and you know, they were playing. And then when she left, I guess little Grant just kept asking where his mother was. And when she returned, he was visibly pleased and relaxed. When Gentle was left alone in the playroom, he was like visibly upset. He didn't seem to know what to do. This was when he was both like alone by himself and alone with a stranger. He like put his head on the door and whimpered and was just very distressed. I think he started crying. And they actually cut that like little interview or experiment, whatever, uh, short and had Laura immediately into the room and she was immediately able to soothe Gentle. When it was Grant's turn, Grant the fourth showed no reaction at all after Grant had left and come back when he entered the room again after leaving. Grant IV had no reaction whatsoever. And he actually continued playing by himself, ignoring his father's calls until his father grabbed like some toys that he wanted out of the chest. And then he became engaged. Gentle completely ignored his father, opting to take the toys that Grant was taking out of the toy chest. Gentle would take the toy, go clear across the room away from his father and play by himself. The only time Gentle went to Grant was when the stranger entered the room. And then that is when Gentle immediately went to his father's feet and sat down. And the animosity between the three continued the passive aggressive behavior when Laura called to have her phone time with the boys continued. Laura continuously pleaded with Grant to like work with her. Like, dude, we need to do this for the kids. They need both of us. But of course, Grant doesn't care, dude. Now it appears from Laura's like notes and journal, she she didn't really like blame Amanda for anything. Her animosity and frustration and anger was directed strictly towards Grant. In fact, it is said Laura actually sent Amanda a thank you note thanking her for like taking care of the boys day to day. Grant stepped up his antics when he tried calling social services on Laura. He alleged that the boys had bruises on them when Laura dropped them off. And the caseworker was already kind of hesitant and like kind of skeptical of, of Grant's story. And then he, they were even like more flabbergasted when Grant started talking about like Laura having STDs 
confused and they were like, why are you bringing this up? And of course, surprise, social services didn't even take Grant seriously. There was no substance to his allegations. In March, Laura would meet a good friend and business partner, Siobhan Mathis. She was working her shift at the Health Habit food store and the two, you know, talked and they discovered they had a lot in common. They shared a conceptual vision for a business. To start an advertising company, selling non-competing ads on like placemats and menus at restaurants and diners and stuff. And I said Siobhan had like the business and the sales acumen while Laura had the graphic design skills. They exchanged numbers, soon met up face to face and just got really excited. And soon their business Fork and Spoon was created. They started building client lists, working on getting company off the ground. And soon they were so busy like working on this business, Laura actually quit her job at the Health Habits food store and dedicated her full time to the business. She soon began going to interviews, making pitches to restaurants. Siobhan worked the phone and they were they were working really hard to make this a thing. Siobhan spent a lot of time working with Laura and of course soon became intimately aware of the custody battle and all that stuff going on. Now in April of 2011, as things were, were picking up for Laura, things were getting pretty bad for Amanda. Apparently Shay went over to her mother's apartment one day and found her, uh, Amanda, who was seven months pregnant, bawling and crying on the floor. She told her daughter she felt trapped. She had no options because her money had all, quote, gone down the drain. I don't want to be a single mother at 40, but there's no way he can even take care of me or these kids. He doesn't need to have these boys if I'm not here. And in May, with her due date just around the corner, Grant left his pregnant wife and went to Hawaii. He stayed with a friend's fiance. Now, Amanda thought that Grant had some gigs lined up, whereas Laura said that he was just going there looking for work. So I'm more inclined to believe Laura just because Grant's a loser. Grant was in Hawaii until past Mother's Day. Yeah, he didn't even spend Mother's Day with his pregnant wife. And this was also as Grant was ranting and raving at anyone and everyone how this was all Laura's fault. It was Laura's fault. They had no money. He had spent tens of thousands of dollars on lawyers in this custody battle. And it was all Laura's fault, guys. And it was because of Laura they had to pawn a lot of Amanda's jewelry. Mm -hmm. Now that same month, Dr. Calloway's finalized report about Laura and Grant came out. In it, uh, she said she found nothing of substance to any of Grant's accusations. Laura did not, quote, poison the children's minds, as he alleged. She did say Laura was, quote, defensive and comes across as tense and stiff during interviews. She said this kind of behavior could lead others not to like trust her or like listen to her allegations. She said due to Laura's quote, lack of self-assurance, it caused her to appear to be facilitating or quote, flip-flopping as Grant asserted, quote, this is an accurate and perceptive comment about her. She's less mature than other adults and is easily overwhelmed relative to other adults. She said Grant's quote, rambling and tangential thinking, including excessive negative commenting about Laura, criticizing the way that he openly disparaged the boy's mother in front of them. Quote, it is concerning when Grant goes on the attack against Laura and betrays her in a highly negative and morally depraved ways. She said his fundamentalist upbringing, where guilt was used as a control mechanism, was, quote, likely the source of his rage at Laura. She noted Grant didn't seem to, quote, understand the impact of his negative talk and disrespect of Laura that this had on the boys. Quote, it is disturbing that his intense rage serves as an anchor for his disturbed thinking. Dr. Calloway said she was also so unnerved by how often Grant and Amanda talked about taking the boys and going far away and living their lives. Quote, it is obvious they do not want Laura included in the children's lives. This is very concerning because in essence, they want to obliterate her. Dr. Calloway said the current custody arrangement was horrible, especially given the boys' age. And she recommended a 2-3-2 split where one party would have them for two days. The other party would have them for three days. Then they'd go back to the first party for two more days. This pattern would start again with the second party going first, and you would have this like alternating week. She suggested that Laura talk to a therapist to help deal with like her anxiety and self-esteem issues, which caused her to become like defensive and react emotionally and impulsively. She also suggested that she join a group of other single mothers to kind of help work on like her confidence as a mother and, you know, like confidence as a parent. She said this was also help her kind of mature and form like healthy relationships with other adults. Dr. Calloway suggested counseling for Grant as well, as well as like basic childhood education. She was basically saying that Grant needed, needed to take like parenting 101 courses, that he was an idiot when it came to being a parent. Like that's pretty much, she was calling him out, like his lack of emotion, his lack of empathy, his selfishness, basically saying that like, you need to take like some child development courses. She also suggested 
suggested that he get psychological counseling and testing to diagnose him with something. And she also suggested that both of them get regularly and sporadically drug tested, something Laura had wanted from the beginning. Now, Laura was stoked at this report. It was said she was actually happy to have like her weaknesses pointed out and like told like, hey, this is what you need to do to address those. It is said that she was really happy to have that, you know, and that she she took this eval very seriously and she was happy. Grant was not thrilled. He knew his control over Laura through the boys was going to wane and his anger and hostility really seeped through in his communications with her. And Laura, like it was so intense, Laura was getting nervous. And she told Heidi, quote, if anything happens to me, even if I commit suicide or if I go missing or if I get into a car accident, know that Grant did it. And the purse strings were tightening even more around Grant and Amanda, especially with the baby coming. And Grant was doing any hustle that he could at this point. He was doing his stupid artwork to try to sell on iPhones and trying to sell stuff that way, doing charcoal prints, and just trying to do anything to get any kind of money. And again, he was always complaining that he had to hustle and grind because of his, quote, crazy ex. But Grant could put on the charm when he needed something from Laura as most manipulators are, right? They're able to turn it on and off. He certainly needed Laura in early June. So Amanda was past her due date at this point, and he needed Laura to take the boys for a week since Amanda just couldn't deal with it all right now. And Laura was, of course, more than happy to oblige and even arranged for Siobhan to take her car and go on the business like pitch meetings she had. Siobhan didn't have a car. And then on Shay's birthday, Amanda's 70-year-old mother passed away and Shay, her future husband, Matt Gadat, and Amanda, they also kept their dinner plans. Basically, so Shay could comfort her mother. But get this, all Grant did was drop Amanda off. He said he had a meeting in Morrisville and he had no concern at all for his very pregnant wife's well-being. Yeah, what a, what a prince, right? Two days later, Amanda gave birth to a daughter, Lillian Ann Love Hayes, who was born on June 9th, 2011, barely a month before the events of today's case. Laura even dropped by the day after with the boys so they could welcome their half-sister. And Grant continued his charade of being a happy family man on, on Facebook and everything, posting happy pictures pictures. He even wrote like a, a song dedicated to Lily that he posted to his YouTube page. But in reality, Grant and Amanda were hurting. They were on the verge of being evicted with three children. And Grant, of course, took his frustrations out on Laura. So apparently on June 15th, Laura got to stop by Monkey Joe's for a surprise midweek visit with her boys. But as they were saying goodbye, the boys, you know, were crying. They didn't want to leave their mom. And Grant, you know, she was trying to console them. And Grant, just getting super pissed off, like I guess forcefully yanked the boys from Laura, threw them in the car and told her that there'd be no more midweek visits. Laura tried to email him, tried to placate him, even tried to make him see that like, hey, me getting like some midweek visitation time with the boys, it actually works for you too. You and Amanda could have some alone time, you know? Anything to get him to reconsider. Because remember, just because Dr. Calloway um, suggested that in her email, they had to go to court and then the judge could go by Dr. Calloway's recommendation or just ignore it. When Laura asked for another midweek visit on June 20th, this set off another chain of emails with Grant once again accusing Laura of negligence, always getting the boys sick. Then they argued about finance and Laura finally emailed him, quote, you're trying to convince Amanda that I was an evil, money-hungry woman out to get you so that you could garner her sympathy and move to a quick emergency wedding, allowing you total access to her money in case she were to wise up. What does it benefit you to have someone so crazy in your past? Does it give you good stories? Or is it just good to manipulate and get sympathy with? How far does the gravy train go? Will I still be the enemy when you're done with Amanda? Why don't you put your energy into writing a sitcom about someone with borderline personality disorder and get rich off your own Back, instead of trying to take advantage of women like Amanda. And this, of course, caused Grant to deny Laura's midweek request. Later that month, Laura had a quick, abrupt call with her brother, Jason. He was at the DMV, so he had to cut it short. And she ended the call with, quote, I love you. And this would be the last time Jason spoke with his sister. On June 28th, Laura met with her attorney, Sergeant, who was impressed with the progress his client had made. They went over their, their game plan, seeing who they could call for character witnesses for Laura, and just kind of lining up all their dominoes to get ready to go to court in August. And this would be the last meeting that Sergeant would have with his client. On July 8th, Laura got to pick the boys up early and they had a lovely weekend together. They played at home, went to a bounce house at the park, did some shopping together. And on Sunday, they went to a different church so she could see whether the, the boys liked it or not. Laura wrote in her journal that Grant IV, quote, had a good weekend and four day week. He watched fireworks, learned about space, compasses, and how popsicles are really made. The boys got along really well and we used the system 
some star charts that improve our interactions greatly. And yeah, this would be the last weekend that Laura spent with her babies. And on Tuesday, July 12th, 2011, Siobhan and Laura spent the whole day together doing things for the business, going car shopping for Siobhan. They got a lot done. And then Grant, who is 32 years old at this point, sent Laura, who's 27, an email asking if she would like to see the boys for a surprise midweek visit. Of course she would. That same day, she also texted with an artist friend. She was helping this friend create a, an, like an art portfolio. The friend's name was Oksana Samarski, and the two made tentative plans for the next day. But Laura said it would all have to revolve around her seeing her kids. Quote, it might still be up in the air. I don't know if I'll see you or not. I have to figure out how to see my kids first and see how that goes. I'll get back to you when I know when. At 9.25 p.m., Grant sent Laura a message. Quote, if you want to try the midweek think again, you can come up tomorrow. Let me know so I can make arrangements with Lauren. Lauren Harris, the manager at Monkey Joe's. I might not be able to stay the whole time because I have packing to do. Laura tried to inquire, like, you know, how long she'd get with the boys. She basically just didn't want another abrupt goodbye again. And this just caused Grant to mock and belittle her. And she ended the conversation by writing, quote, It is the most frustrating thing I know of to deal with a parent partner who doesn't view love in the same light that I do. At 10 p.m. that evening, Grant emailed his friend Mark from the Virgin Islands, telling him that he wouldn't be back there until August because of, quote, a court date for child support and shit. Nobody is going to give a black guy custody over a white girl. And North Carolina ain't gonna let me share custody unless I stay here. And I can't make a living here. I'm just gonna let Laura keep the boys. He said his plans after that were, were to return to the Virgin Islands with Amanda and his daughter. And the next day, July 13th, 2011, Laura's apartment cameras show her walking out of the building at 8, 10 a.m. She had several pitch meetings that day and one after the other, she got him. She had like five or six meetings that day and she got every single one. As she was leaving her last meeting for the day, Bill's Grill, which was five miles southeast of Wilson, she mentioned having another appointment to go to in Raleigh and the man she met with, Randy Jenkins, told her like, dude, traffic's pretty bad. You might just want to cancel. But she just smiled and said, quote, no, I really have to go to this appointment. And at 4 8 p.m., Grant sent Laura a text, quote, would you like to keep the boys for the week until Sunday the 24th? And at 4.12 p.m., she responded with, quote, okay, I'm leaving Wilson now. I'll call when I get past the traffic. Where will you be in an hour or so? Laura then called her friend Oksana and left a voicemail at 4.19 p.m. And it was, quote, hey lady, it's Laura. I'm heading into Raleigh. I'll be there in about an hour, but, um, I'm gonna go visit with my boys. Don't know what's gonna happen as far as that's concerned. So, uh, I'll just give you a call when I'm done. And I just wanted to let you know, too, I don't know if I'll be able to see you before seven, but just wanted to find out if you're going to be available after that at any point. Give me a call. I'll talk to you later. Bye. And this is the last known message or communication of Laura. Laura then called Grant at 4.59 p.m. Her cell phone was pinged near the Crabtree Valley Mall, which was right near Grant's apartment. And this is the last time anyone saw or heard or spoke with Laura. Now, Siobhan knew that Laura had spoken with Oksana, but was not aware of like the surprise visit with her sons. Laura had told Siobhan that she would call her later that evening, probably around nine, but that call would never come. So the next morning, Siobhan tried to call Laura, but her cell phone was off, which immediately struck her as a red flag. Laura never had that phone off. She was always concerned about her boys calling her, so she always had it on. So because this sent an immediately red flag, Siobhan walked up to Laura's apartment building and peered through the gate. It was like gated, so she couldn't like walk up to the apartment and knock. And she did not see Laura's white 2006 Ford Focus in the parking lot, and this troubled her. Siobhan sent her friend an email on Friday, just after noon, just asking if she was okay but she never received a response. Grant had also sent Laura an email earlier that Friday, only it was like at 4.08 a.m. He asked if she would like the boys for a week, and he sent her another email that same day, just after 2 p.m., and he was berating her for not returning any of his calls or texts. Quote, this is not cool. He then went on a rant in this email, chastising her for her parenting, once again, blaming her for his problems, saying his family was moving to Kinston for her. Quote, you're not holding up your end of things, and that's real fucked up. We're trying to reach a settlement, and then go dark on me after agreeing to, shall I say, certain terms? Yes, real fucked up. I'm moving my family to Kinston, yet again to accommodate you. Not our kids, but you. He also added, quote, do not try to talk to me about anything at the exchange today. I have nothing more to say to you until I hear from your attorney. And for the next couple of days, the rest of that weekend, no one could get a hold of Laura. On Monday, July 18th, Siobhan had called Patsy and asked, like, hey, did Laura pick up her kids this past Friday? And when Patsy said no, that is when Siobhan went down to the police. She went to the Kinston 
Winston police station, explained the whole situation, including like the custody battle. She then went went to the Wilson police department and the Raleigh police departments as well to report the same thing. She was very concerned about Laura. Detective James Gortney then interviewed Siobhan, who gave him like business notebooks and a bunch of other stuff that Laura had written in, including her, her planner with all of her scheduled appointments. Siobhan told them about Laura having to meet Grant every Friday at 5 p.m. So, of course, he was the next person police spoke to. And that was over the phone. They called Grant up and he told Detective Gortney that the last time he had seen Laura was Wednesday, July 13th. She had stopped by his place to pick the boys up and had taken them to Monkey Joe's. He said she returned them between 9 and 9.30, but he didn't think they had gone to Monkey Joe's because the boys were, quote, sweaty and they hadn't eaten. He said it was only him, Amanda, and the kids in the apartment that night that Amanda had taken the children into another room as he and Laura spoke about an agreement. And this agreement said that he would sign away full custody to Laura. He said Laura left his apartment about 10 p.m. that night. And when Gortney asked him to forward all of the emails and exchanges he had with Laura, Grant said he couldn't. Quote, I'm in the boonies and have bad reception. Grant said he was on the outskirts of Raleigh, headed towards Kinston, and he didn't have a good signal right now. And apparently Gortney, who's from the area, sort of like raised an eyebrow at this. And he's like, wait, there's like areas around there that like have no reception? What? That's weird. Gortney then told Grant that like, you know, I need you to come in and provide a written statement. Like, this is serious. And Grant said like, you know what? I'll just email you a statement at the same time that I forward you all those other emails. Grant told the detective about the ongoing custody battle and all that. He informed the detective about the pickup arrangement they had and how Laura had not been there on Friday. And they hung up with Gortney thinking that Grant was going to come in and was going to send those emails like within a few minutes. But surprise, surprise, Grant never came in and he never sent those emails. Gortney then moved the case to Raleigh where Laura was last seen and Detective Jerry Falk then took lead on the case. Authorities then looked at the CCTV footage at the Sheets gas station to see if Grant had been there on Friday to meet up with Laura. So it shows him showing up at 3.30 p.m. At 4.30, he goes inside and buys cigarettes, exits the back door, comes in a few minutes later, buys something else. At 4.58 p.m., he came into the store with the boys this time. They went to the restroom. Then they walked outside and sat at one of the shaded tables. At 5.16 p.m., Grant entered the store and bought some drinks for the boys. And they sat at the table and surveillance footage shows Grant and the boys leaving the parking lot at 5.46 p.m. after Laura failed to show up. On July 19th, the Raleigh police put out a bolo for Laura, be on the lookout. And when they found out there had been no activity in her bank accounts since the 10th, they went back Back to her apartment and the manager opened it up for them. And when they searched it, it was clear the kids were a number one priority in Laura's life. There was, of course, a bunch of kids stuff and toys and stuff all around. They saw the numerous plants that she had and that they were dying as if they hadn't had water in a couple days. And they, of course, found her daily log of interactions with Grant and Amanda. They looked at the surveillance footage that the apartment complex had saw that she had left that Friday at 8 a.m. And some reports were conflicting, but it was either the same day or like the 20th where Laura's story was released to the media. Now, after she was reported missing, I guess Grant's mother, Patsy, was asked how she thought this would affect the boys. And I thought her answer was kind of weird. She said, quote, they get over things a lot faster and they could probably not be affected by things as much as adults are, you know, because they are small and they're very resilient. So they probably figure they're just staying with dad right now. I thought that was kind of weird because because it's like, dude, Grant the Fourth is like, what, th almost three at this point? I think that's pretty old to, to know that your parent is missing. But I don't know. I don't have kids. What do I know? And on July 20th, Oksana told police about that voicemail that Laura had left. And as police were getting that info from her, Laura's car was found in a parking lot. It was in an, another apartment complex parking lot that was 400 yards from Grant and Amanda's apartment. They checked Laura's car, found no signs of a struggle. There was some damage on the right rear side of her car, but I don't think it was like major. And now they knew that Laura had disappeared sometime on Friday, July 15th, between 419 p.m. and 7 p.m. Authorities also believed Grant knew more than he was sharing, possibly even involved. Laura's friends and family, of course, had told police all about the contentious custody battle going on. And remember, Laura had made that statement to Heidi about like, dude, something happens to me. It's totally Grant. Sergeant also informed police that Laura had expressed to him that she was kind of afraid of her physical safety as they were getting closer 
closer to the court date. And this all prompted police to call Grant again because they couldn't locate him physically. So they called him again, asking him to come in. And that's when Grant told them like, oh, you know what? I totes would, but I'm out of town at the moment. And in the meantime, as Grant and Amanda are out of town, police were able to secure search warrants for their apartment. They had also interviewed Shay at this point, and she did accompany officers as they searched her mother's apartment. So this was all on the same day that they had found Laura's car. Like it... Boom, boom, boom. Stuff with this case kind of broke kind of fast. So police said when they entered the apartment, an overwhelming, nauseating stench of bleach just like engulfed them. It was just immediately apparent as soon as they opened the door. And in the front room, like right there by the door, it was a large bleach stain. Not only was it apparent because it was right by the door and it was large, the carpet was also dark. So of course it really stood out. In the bathroom, there was a more overwhelming stench of bleach. And... The whole bathroom was like spotless, almost too spotless, you know? And the shower rod and shower curtain were all missing. Several rugs were also missing from the apartment. I believe Shay was informing them like what was missing or something. While they were searching the apartment, they found a handwritten note that was dated July 13th and it had Laura's signature on it. It appeared to be some sort of agreement. It read, quote, I, Laura J. Ackerson, for the sum of $25,000, agree not to pursue custody of the two minor children, Grant and Gentle Hayes. I am not surrendering parental rights, but I do consent to leaving them in the sole custody of their father for now. Further, I agree to drop all pending litigation against their father in the Lenora County Family Court in a home studio office. Investigators found handwritten lyrics for a couple of songs that Grant had written and recorded. One was a song called man killer, and it revolved around the first person perspective of killing a woman, specifically by strangling her and making her bleed. So some of the lyrics were, quote, give in to me, I want it all. I want your scream and I want your crawl. I'll make you bleed, fall to the floor. Don't try to plead. That turns me on. I'll start the keys to your car and some more. As the dogs come, try to walk them over. Start your line there, right around her shoulder. As her mom and dad come, walk them away. Tell them she died fast. They'll know she wasn't in pain. I'm not the one to make you scream. I'm just the one to make you bleed. Don't raise your arms. You can't stop me. I'll put my hands on your throat and squeeze. Hallelujah. They found lyrics to other songs, such as Baby Mama, that said, quote, Baby Mama, I got two kids by you. I can't take any more from you. The way we slept was so cold. I'd wake up every morning wondering which of us would go. I'm paying her bills. Find another sugar daddy. You trying to take my kids. That's the way you live. I warned you. Don't say I didn't warn you. I don't want your drama. I have two kids by you. I can't take anything more from you. Price tag on your head. You must have told your attorney I have intentions to kill you. So yeah, clearly Grant was not just actively taking out his aggression on Laura. It was also consuming his supposed music. And later, Shay would find an instruction manual for a reciprocating saw in the apartment that she handed over to police. And this saw is usually used for remodeling and construction. Now, police would discover that Grant had purchased that saw along with blades, trash bags, goggles, tarp, bleach, a lint roller, tape, plastic sheeting, and gloves at a Walmart in Briar Creek, which was three miles away. And he bought these things on July 14th, Saturday, just after 2 a.m. They found out later that that same morning, Amanda had called her daughter, who was 22 at that point, and asked her to watch the children, right? This was much later in the day. Shay arrived around 10 in the morning and took the boys to Monkey Joe's for like the first part of the day. And by 3.30 p.m., they were getting cranky, kind of getting in trouble a little bit. So she called and was like, hey, can we come home yet? But Amanda had just told her, quote, we need about two more hours. We're looking for a moving truck. And when Shay finally was allowed to come back and drop off the kids, Amanda said that her and Grant needed a vacuum. They needed to borrow her vacuum. Now, Shay had just moved in with Matt on the other side of Raleigh, and she sort of like balked at like, you want me to drive to my apartment and rush hour traffic halfway across the city for a vacuum? And Amanda pleaded with her, like just insisting her like, no, 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 I need it. I need it right now. I need you to do this. I need it. So Shay finally relented. Amanda also asked her to pick up dinner on the way back. After getting Matt's permission, because it was his vacuum, Shay did as her mother requested. She got back to the apartment around six that evening, where Grant was taking photos of the sofa and the love seat to post them on sale on Craigslist. So looking at more receipts and surveillance tapes, authorities discovered that Grant had returned to Walmart the next day on Sunday, the 15th. And this was around noon, and he bought six large red and black duffel bags. On July 16th, he had returned to the store, bought three bags of ice and a 120-quart cooler, and returned three of the duffel 
duffel bags. And for that, he instead got a 75 quart cooler. Then that same night, Grant had gone to Target at 8, 10 p.m. and purchased two Igloo Max Cool coolers, a 75 quart one and a 50 quart one, along with a toilet brush and paper towels. Now, as they're discovering all this, all right, at this point, police are very anxious to talk to Grant. They're finding out all this information. It's coming out very quick, all right? I believe they found out all this information the same day they got into Grant and Amanda's apartment. But at this point, they still didn't really know where Grant and Amanda were. All Grant had said was that he was out of town. But Shay told police that her mother and Grant had rented a U-Haul. And this was the same day that Grant had bought the coolers and the ice. She said that the family had decided to take the boys on a spontaneous trip to Texas to see Amanda's sister, Karen. So around 7.30 p.m. on the 15th, Amanda had called her daughter and said, quote, we're not moving tomorrow. We're thinking about about going to Texas. And, you know, when Amanda was like, oh my god, can I come? I haven't seen Aunt Karen a lot. I guess, like, Amanda just really overreacted and was like, no, like, what are you, selfish? No, my mom just died and I just gave birth. Like, no, you can't come with me. I need my sister. And, like, just really kind of snapped at her daughter for even daring to ask to go on this trip. She told her, quote, so I won't need you. I have to go now. Grant just came in with the boys. Shay said that she had heard Grant loudly complaining, like, It was very loud. It was very odd that she could hear him this clearly, but he was loudly complaining that Laura had failed to show up on that Friday. And the Hayes family left for Richmond, Texas that Saturday, July 16th at midnight, and they arrived in Texas in the early morning hours of July 18th around 5 a.m. So, you know, they're finding out this information, so police decide to stake out Grant's parents' home just in case Grant and Amanda showed up there. And another team went to the U-Haul place to confirm that Grant did indeed go there. They talked to employees who remembered Grant. He had made comments about going fishing in Texas and having coolers full of fish bait. He seemed very calm and at ease, like he was going on vacation or something. He rented a trailer and bought boxes, a sofa cover, a lock, and a ball mount for his Durango, which would enable him to tow the U-Haul trailer. And then detectives Robert Latour and Dexter Grill went on a road trip to Richmond, Texas. They wanted to talk to Amanda's sister, Karen, possibly even run into Grant and Amanda because they were looking for them. Now, when the detectives got to Texas to interview her, it is said Karen did not seem at all surprised to see them. It almost seemed like she was expecting them. She asked authorities if she could pray before she said what she had to say. It is said she was very reluctant and hesitant to talk to the police, but she said that she she had to tell them what she knew, and it was very upsetting to her. So she did confirm that her sister, Grant, and the children had come to see her. In fact, she had had her son Dalton um, mow the pathway down to the boat. She lived, like, right behind, like, a creek slash, like, river, and she had, like, a small boat And Grant and Amanda had talked about wanting to take the boys fishing, so she had Dalton mow a a pathway down to there. And she told police that while they were there during their stay, Amanda had told her that she and Grant had hurt Laura. She said on July 19th, Amanda had said, quote, I hurt Laura and I hurt her bad. Karen said that Grant joined in this conversation and both had asked if she had any large holes on her property. Like, she's like, well, like, I have like a septic tank, but you know, she was getting like uneasy. They kept asking her if she knew about any, quote, deep places. Places around her property or on her property. And still, neither of them would elaborate on Amanda's comment. And then finally, Karen said that she told them, quote, if this is bad, really bad, it's best to tell the truth. I know an attorney you can talk to if you need to talk to an attorney. But they just kind of ignored her and Karen went to like show them like her her septic tank, like where that was. And she was just kind of feeling uneasy. She didn't know what was going on. And so finally she told them like, you know what? I don't know what's going on. I don't know what you're talking about, but I don't want you using my property for anything nefarious. Like, no, I'm not going to show you my septic tank. Like, no, I I don't know any about deep places on my property or anything. Like, no. Grant then said that he needed to purchase some acid. So Karen gave him directions to the local Home Depot. There, he purchased chemical gloves, a 32-gallon trash can, and four one-gallon bottles of muriatic acid. He told the employee there who had helped him that he intended to use the acid to, to clean out the pig pen and get rid of the smell. And this was despite the employee insisting, he, like, dude, the acid isn't going to get rid of the smell. This isn't like what, you know, what you need for what you're saying you need it for. But Grant just, you know, didn't pay him no mind and bought it. Karen then told the detectives that the couple had come to her on the evening of July 19th. I believe this was like after the Home Depot run and after that weird unsettling conversation and asked if they could borrow her small boat to go to Oyster Creek. They wanted to go fishing. Karen's daughter, Candace, was also there. She had been there visiting and she saw Amanda retrieve some water bottles, a black pair of sweatpants, and a 
thermal shirt before exiting the house and going to, to Grant. Karen said that she saw her sister and Grant get something out of the U-Haul as they were preparing to leave on her boat, but she was too busy and distracted with the kids to see what exactly they were doing. She said during their stay there, Grant had also asked Dalton and her other son, Shelton, some really weird questions. Like if there were alligators in the creek behind the house, if alligators ate people, like where exactly they were in the creek, what the creek's depth was, how long it ran. Amanda had also asked Shelton if feral hogs ate people. He had a business of like catching like wild feral hogs and she was asking him if they ate people. And before the couple had left her home, Karen said that she had taken her sister aside, looked her in the eye and said, quote, I'm going to ask you this one time and one time only and I want the truth and I'll never ask you any questions again. Are you covering for Grant? And Amanda reportedly looked her sister in the eye and nodded her head. Karen then gave the detectives a machete that Grant had left behind, along with some rags that he had used to clean out some of the coolers before he left. They had also left behind, I think it was like two or three of the coolers, and she gave those over to police as well. When they had left, again, she had such an e uneasy feeling when she saw some of the stuff that Grant had left behind. She had carefully like put it in her shed, and she said after her sons had found stories of Laura's disappearance, because remember, her story went out to the media like, I don't know, 19th or 20th or something like that, and Carrot said like, at that point, Grant and Amanda had left and that when she came across the stories of Laura's disappearance and Grant's connection to Laura, she was worried that she was going to get a phone call and Amanda and the kids were going to be found dead on the side of the road somewhere. So using all the information that Karen had given them, a Houston police dive team, along with officers from North Carolina, including the detectives, were then dispatched to Oyster Creek on Sunday, July 24th. The weather was 100 degrees Fahrenheit and the waters were 89 degrees and things like the Lily pads and like all of like the overgrowth and stuff just really made their job very difficult. They were hoping to find some sort of remains. Um, ideally, maybe Laura's foot because she had a tattoo on there and it would make identification quick and easy. And it's searching in these hot, swampy, muddy waters where they would find pieces of Laura's remains. They first found pieces of an armless headless female torso. It was cut at the neck, as well as at the shoulders, below the ribs, and just above the hip at the navel. 30 yards from that, they found a piece of a leg. The next day, on the 25th, just after 9 a.m., they went back out to see if they could find more remains. And at 3.09 p.m., among the roots of like some lily pads, one of the divers, Brian Davis, who was with the Houston Police Department, spotted a smooth, hairless object among the lily pads. He thought it might be a femur bone, but as Davis and his partner wrote rolled the object over, they were horrified to see a face. What Davis had actually seen was the back of the skull. The water had apparently, because it was face down, had held the skin and muscle in place. But when they had pulled the head to the surface, it immediately started sliding off the bone and it ended up like gathering like right here around the chin, like, oh my God, that's so gruesome. That's awful. All of these remains were found 50 yards from Karen's home. And using dental records, the remains were confirmed to be that of Laura. About 60% of her body would end up being recovered. And Chief Deputy Craig Brady of the Fort Bend Sheriff's Office said of finding Laura's body, quote, it's one of the most gruesome scenes I've seen in 30 something years of law enforcement. Autopsy results would later reveal evidence of asphyxiation and evidence of blunt force trauma to the neck, but no official cause of death could be determined because the body was so badly decomposed. Her official cause of death is listed as, quote, homicide by undetermined means slash undetermined homicidal violence. Now, by the time Laura's remains were found, Grant and Amanda were back in North Carolina. On July 22nd, Grant's vehicle was spotted in the parking lot of an attorney's office. And when they went to Grant's parents, that's when police swooped in. They already had warrants to search the Durango, both of their phones, and fingerprints print and photograph both of them. They were then brought back to Grant's parents' home after midnight, after they had been, I guess, like officially processed, I guess is the word. Now, throughout all of this, it is said Grant was very relaxed and composed, but that's not how he was when he was speaking with friends and acquaintances. He made it sound like he was worried about Laura and said he was scared because he was a black guy and she was a white woman missing and he was going to get blamed and he was just like really hamming this aspect up. And on July 25th, 
the same day that more of Laura's remains were found in Texas, Grant and Amanda were officially arrested, and both of them refused to speak and each exercised their right to an attorney. They were indicted on August 5th for first-degree murder, and on Thursday, August 11th, the Gulf Coast Water Authority in Texas was performing, I guess, routine cleaning of some water gates under, like, some bridges, and at a gate located three-tenths of a mile from Karen's home, they found a portion of Laura's leg. Now, no one knows exactly what happened in that apartment, just that Grant and or Amanda murdered Laura in the third floor apartment in Raleigh and using a machete and a power saw, the reciprocating saw that they found, they had dismembered her, sawing off the head and separating the limbs. And it, it, it was theorized so she would be easier to transport to Texas. They had driven more than 1,200 miles with pieces of Laura's body in those coolers and ice chests. Now it is said Grant and Amanda wanted to dissolve Laura's body using that muriatic acid but it wasn't working nearly as fast as they thought it was going to. It was just taking much too long. So that is when they went to plan B. They went to Oyster Creek in Fort Bend County and set out on the small 10-foot boat owned by Karen. And since the acid didn't work, they were going to just put Laura's body parts in the creek with the hopes that alligators would eat her remains. Once they got back on the next morning, July 20th, after withdrawing more cash from an ATM, driving Shelton's truck, Amanda had placed the remaining boxes of acid like on the side of a road like under a tree and there was like a secret camera there recording her. Apparently that area was known for like illegal dumping and stuff. So authorities had installed a secret camera and it had recorded Amanda getting rid of the muriatic acid and the unused boxes of it. As she was doing that that's when Grant was cleaning out the coolers with those rags and Dalton was even helping because they didn't know what was going on, right? Karen and, and Dalton and Shelton didn't know what was going on. But Dalton said that Grant was on the phone the whole time and he overheard him say, quote, I don't need an alibi. I was with my family. And remember, he had left two coolers behind because they just didn't have the room. They had returned the U-Haul. And remember, he had also left the machete behind. He told Shelton, quote, I don't need it. I was going to use it fishing or alligator hunting. And Grant and Amanda then hightailed it back to North Carolina before it was discovered they had taken the kids across state lines. But, as we know, the discarded remains were not eaten by alligators, and they did remain intact. Now, neither Laura's phone, recorder, the two bags she had with her when she left that morning, or the clothes she was wearing that morning were ever recovered. Now, it said in the aftermath of all of this, Shay suffered quite a bit. She jumped into a marriage with Matt, thinking that it would help her get custody of Lily. But Grant wrote to Child Services, spinning his same tale about Shay being like a druggie and a sex worker and all that. And I was confused if Shay and Matt remained married or not. All I know is that Shay just had to move back to New Mexico with her father. Apparently everyone in that area was just telling her that she should be ashamed of herself. I think people thought she had more to do with it and was like covering for her mom. And she just had to get back to New Mexico and just kind of get away from that. Patsy and Grant II now had custody of all three of the children. And after their son's arrest, it is said two thirds of their clients at their daycare center stopped coming and they did eventually lose that business. So Grant would end up being represented by defense attorneys, William Durham and Jeff Cullen. He pleaded not guilty, and his trial happened on August 26th, 2013, and it would last for three weeks. So the original plan was to try Grant and Amanda together, but after Amanda's lawyers filed a bunch of motions that pretty much was going to lay out what their defense was going to be, it was decided that they would have separate trials, and... We'll, we'll get into it. Grant was prosecuted by Wake County Assistant District Attorney Bob Zellinger and Becky Holt, and he was judged by Superior Court Judge Donald Stevens. Now, it said all throughout the proceedings, Grant seemed very at ease, even like kind of like, you know, sitting back and laughing like he was having a good time. Now, at his trial, the prosecution theorized that Laura had come over to Grant and Amanda's apartment that day, and that while there, an argument broke out about custody. They theorized that perhaps Grant and Amanda had offered her like the 25000 thousand dollar agreement or something, but she rejected it and things escalated from there. Now, there is some contention on whether it was really Laura's signature on that document, although I believe it was like thought to be, but you know, knowing what we know, for all we know, Laura could have been coerced into signing it. You know what I mean? Laura's friends and family adamantly testified that she would never give up custody of her children, especially for some like crap, some like 25 grand. She would never do that. An inmate, Pablo Trinidad, also testified against Grant. He testified that Grant had told him him and Amanda had strangled Laura. So in July of 2011, Pablo 
Butler was being held in the Wake County Detention Center on federal charges, and Grant was also being housed here at this time. Now, according to Pablo, Grant's case, I guess, was like on TV, and a bunch of inmates wanted to like plan to like jump Grant or something. They wanted to like give him a bunch of shit. And Pablo was the one who sort of like de-escalated the situation and was like, hey man, you do that, we're all gonna get in trouble. And he managed to, you know, get the inmates off of Grant's back. And Grant was extremely thankful to Pablo for this. And it wasn't long before Grant started talking to his newfound friend. Pablo testified that Grant told him, quote, he told me that Laura was the mother of his children. He said that she was an unfit mother and they'd been in a custody battle for years. She was soliciting herself on the internet, doing drugs, continuously asking for money. He was tired of going back and forth with that. He placed a call to Laura and lured her to his apartment. He and his wife subdued her and strangled her and after that dismembered the body and took a road trip to a family member's home. His exact words about what he did with the body were, quote, I just got rid of it. The prosecution also showed all of the footage of Grant buying all of the supplies at all of the different locations, and even read and played his lyrics for Man Killer and Baby Mama. And get this, when they were playing the songs, because again, I think he had recorded parts of these songs, if not the whole thing, Grant was like bopping his head as they were playing the songs. Bro, read the room. Now, the defense tried to say it was in fact Amanda who had killed Laura, and it was a horrible accident. Durham said, quote, this case is about a man covering up his wife's actions. According to Durham, Amanda was angry that Grant was going to give Laura 25 grand, like 25 grand of money they didn't even have, and that she then killed Laura while Grant was away. They did not elaborate how Laura died or how Amanda killed her. They claimed that Grant only helped his wife dispose of the body afterwards and didn't do the actual killing. Quote, the evidence will show the death happened in a spontaneous, unpredictable way, and that what happened next, quote, are terrible decisions of people who are terrified. And after only an hour and a half of deliberations, Grant was found guilty of first-degree murder on September 16th, 2013. He was sentenced to an automatic life behind bars without the possibility of parole, and Judge Stevens said, quote, a jury decision in an hour and a half? probably speaks louder than anything anyone can say about this case, from the state's perspective, from the family's perspective. Grant is currently serving his sentence, the Caledonia Correctional Institution, in Halifax County, North Carolina. He attempted to appeal his sentence, but it was denied in March of 2015. Amanda's trial started on January 21st, 2014, and that was jury selection, and it would last for approximately a month. So Amanda pled not guilty, and was represented by attorneys Rosemary Godwin and Johnny Gaskins. She was prosecuted and judged by the same people as Grant. Now, Amanda's defense was that she never hurt Laura, never physically abused her, and did not have a hand in her death. The defense claimed Grant was a, quote, sociopath, who could seem charming, witty, very talented, while also being, quote, controlling, manipulative, and deceitful. Grant Hayes is the classic sociopath. Grant saw women as people who needed to be controlled by him. They needed to be submissive to him. They contended that Laura had come over, tripped over a rug, injured herself, and that's when Grant sent Amanda, along with the three children, outside of the home so that he could call emergency services. Now, later that evening, according to Gaskins, Grant told Amanda that Laura was okay and she had left their apartment on her own. Gaskins theorized that Grant could have strangled Laura with his Apple cord computer cord. Grant had purchased a new one with cash. No one could ever find the original cord. He also theorized that Grant could have drained Laura's body of blood through a wound in her neck and performed the dismemberment elsewhere because there was no blood found in Grant and Amanda's apartment. And they were theorizing that Grant had done the dismemberment somewhere else, perhaps at some of the properties that his parents owned, some of which were vacant lots. But pretty sure all of those were searched and nothing was ever found. Now, they tried to argue that Grant had, quote, fooled Amanda into taking that trip to Texas and told her, like, oh, we're going to move some furniture there. You've wanted to move some furniture down there? We're going to go ahead and do that. But when they got there, that's when Grant supposedly revealed to her that they had actually just transported Laura's body and that she was dead. They also contended that he had threatened Amanda and said that she was going to help him dispose of Laura's body. They also tried to say that that comment Amanda had made to Karen about her hurting Laura, Amanda had only done that under coercion of Grant because they wanted Karen to help them. And Grant said that if she thought Amanda had killed Laura, she would be more likely to help them. Amanda's defense tried to claim that Grant regularly like beat her and abused her and said that she only helped dispose of, of Laura's remains because she was scared of like her own safety and for the safety of the children. Her attorneys claimed Grant had even sent a threatening letter to Amanda from behind bars. And 
There was really no proof ever found of like physical abuse between the couple, though Godwin tried really hard to like paint this picture of like an abused and battered woman. Karen also testified, and Amanda took the stand in her own defense. She testified the last time she saw Laura was at her and Grant's apartment on July 13th, that the ex-couple were arguing over custody. She said Laura had accidentally bumped into her um, during an argument. She had wanted to hold Lily and Amanda had just turned around to ignore her and started walking and Amanda followed her and tripped over a rug, accidentally bumping her. At that point, Gra Grant stepped in and she said the next thing she knew that Laura was on the floor. Actually, Amanda would change this little fact right here. She said one time that she was in the room watching the movie Cars with all of the kids when Laura had tripped and fallen. And then she said this version when she was on the stand that, oh, no, 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 Laura had accidentally bumped into me, uh, tripped on a rug, and then Grant was there. And the next thing she knew, Laura was on the floor. She testified that Grant told her to quickly get the kids out of there so like the boys didn't see their mom on the floor like that. She said that she did as she was told, drove around Raleigh for a while. She added a new detail here while she was on the stand and said that she had stopped and gotten cigarettes. And she said when she got home, the apartment was very smoky, like very smoky and Grant was smoking cigarettes. She said he mumbled something about Laura leaving and she said it was only after they were at Karen's in Texas that she discovered Laura was dead and that they had transported parts of her body. She said, quote, I'll never forget it. He was smoking a cigarette and he was really calm and he told me, what would you do if I told you Laura was dead? Amanda said that Grant told her he had panicked. Quote, he told me he got scared, that he was a black man with a dead white woman and nobody was going to believe him. Amanda said that she was scared. Quote, I was so afraid. I invited this guy into my family. I was trying to get him away from my family. However, the prosecution called Patsy Hayes, Grant's mother, and she read numerous letters that Amanda had written to her so that Patsy could then read them to her son. So in one letter, Amanda asked Patsy to relay a message to Grant, quote, please tell my husband that I love him very much and I think about him every day. In another letter, Amanda included a letter for Grant for Patsy to read slash give to him. And talked about wanting to coordinate like meditation times and quote, I want you to know how much I love you with all my heart. Now the defense tried to counter these letters saying like, well, you know, her mother-in-law has her daughter and she has to keep up this like persona of being happy so that she can still get access to her daughter. The prosecution also called, I can't remember if all three of these cellmates testified, but there were three cellmates, right? That all had shit to say about Amanda. Now look, when inmates testify, right? You can take it as like, oh, they're just trying and, you know, shave time off. You got to take it with a grain of salt. Now, look, when one, one inmate testifies, okay, I can understand that. Two, and they're saying the same thing. Okay, that going to raise an eyebrow, but it's like, okay, but when three inmates are testifying against you and they're all saying the same thing and these inmates don't have like anything to do with one another... Come on, man. I don't think that looks very good. So there was this one inmate, Patricia Barakat, and she said that Amanda had told her that Laura had died at the apartment after an accident in the kitchen. And she also revealed how much Amanda had said that she hated Laura, despised her, and thought she was an unfit mother and, quote, psycho crazy, which is Amanda's favorite phrase, apparently. And in fact, Patricia was talking about, like, how phony Amanda was. So there was this point where Holt was cross-examining Amanda, who was on the stand, taking the stand in her own defense. And there was a point, I forget exactly what Holt did, but she like kept pushing Amanda, right? Now, all throughout the trial, Amanda, you know, was, was trying to talk like this and try to look really innocent, you know, to, you know, I understand doing that, trying to hype up you know, what you're trying to say here, right? That you're a battered woman and you're just very sweet and whatnot. And it was the evil Grant who took you down this path. But apparently Holt kept digging at her. I forget exactly what it was, but she kept digging at her. And finally, finally, the real Amanda peeked out and like in her response, like that, that false sweetness and that false like pitch up into her voice like dropped and Patricia was saying on the stand like no nah, when you when you had her like that and she let that facade drop that's the real Amanda that's the Amanda I saw behind bars. And she described Amanda as being the type of person who would pretty much suck up and kiss ass to anyone who could do something for her. But in actuality, yeah, she was just a cold, pretty much a two-faced bitch. <laughs> Amanda apparently had also told Patricia how bitter she was that Grant had spent so much time and money getting custody of the two boys. And she wished, get this, she wished Lily had been born a boy because then maybe Grant would be more willing to walk away from custody from Grant the Fourth and gentle. 
What a hag. And after nearly 13 hours of deliberations over the course of three days, Amanda was found guilty of second degree murder, not first degree. And this was on February 18th, 2014. She was sentenced to 13 to 16 years in prison. And after her sentence, Amanda said in a statement, quote, I would just like to apologize with my whole heart, being and soul, first to Laura. I apologize to her, to her family, to her children, to my family, to Grant's family, to everyone who had to work this case, to everyone who had to sit through this trial, to everyone who was in the media, who has had to watch and at least touch their lives. I am so, so sorry that this touched my life in any shape, form, or fashion, or anyone I love to care about, or anyone, and I am truly, truly sorry with every ounce of my soul. Grant and Amanda finally divorced on August 21st, that same year, 2014, and it was finalized in October. And in August of 2018, Amanda was tried in Texas for helping Grant dispose of Laura's body. Amanda pled not guilty, once again, asserting the same thing she did at her original trial in North Carolina. And after only 90 minutes of deliberations on August 21st, the jury convicted Amanda of tampering with evidence and she was sentenced to the maximum sentence allowed, 20 years. She was ordered to serve the sentence consecutive with the North Carolina sentence. So as soon as she's done in North Carolina, she gets to be sent to Texas and serve her sentence there. She is currently serving her sentence in Anson Correctional Institution for women in Popeton, North Carolina. And and prosecutors in Texas opted not to prosecute Grant in Texas since he already got a life without parole. It seemed the main reason prosecutors in Texas decided to go after Amanda is they thought her sentence that she received in North Carolina was not harsh enough. And all three of Grant's children are in the custody of his parents. And apparently they are in regular contact with Shay, who in the book I read said this about her mother, quote, don't be fooled. Amanda was a manipulator too. Grant was not the only one. Amanda met her match in Grant. And oh my God, can you believe it? We're at the end of this case. Holy bananas, that was a long one. So many thoughts. Grant and Amanda are trash. They are trash. They are subhuman. They are scumbags. They deserve each other. What do you guys think? Do you believe Amanda's story? I'm sorry, dude. After reading uh, this book, Bitter Remains by Diane Fanning, I definitely, I gotta tell you, like at first... I did have like some sympathy for Amanda and I'm like, oh dude, she just seems like she kind of got like sucked into this. That kind of sucks. But as I got further into the book and, you know, got to that last page where Shay says that about her mother, I was like, ooh, yeah, screw this bitch. That's why she, people like her are so insidious, right? Like you want to feel sorry for her. But truly, I don't, I think she had just as much premeditation and thought in Laura's murder as her husband did. I think she planned it with him. She was not battered. Was she being manipulated and probably like financially abused and shit? Yeah. But I don't think Grant ever like physically hurt her. There was no reports of that. Shay never, you know, said that. But yeah, I'm so curious. What do you guys think? I mean, come on, dude. Amanda totally had everything to do with it. I was laughing though that like, yeah, so she got her, what was it, 13, 18 years in North Carolina, probably out sooner with good behavior, right? And then boom, Texas was like, nah, bitch, we're going after you. Like apparently the Texas prosecutors and the people in Texas involved with this case were very offended at her sentence in North Carolina. And that was part of why they prosecuted her. Yeah, I don't, I don't know, man. Tell me what you think about this case. Thank you so much to Becky D for sending me down this rabbit hole. I just, my heart breaks for Laura. Poor Laura. She was on her way to, to making her life better, you know? I just, I feel so sorry for, for women like this. The, like, you know, the naive ones, the innocent ones, like... I just want to take them and hug them and just be like, no, you deserve better, you know? It's just so sad. And yeah, I think that will will do it for the last case of January. Remember, I am not uploading next week. January has five Tuesdays. I'm taking this fifth Tuesday off. But if you do want some more true crime fix, I am still uploading on Thursday for Crime Dip. And I will be back February 7th for another deep dive. I've got lots of books on other cases that I'm reading right now. Like you guys throw some meaty ones my way. And meaty ones that have have, like big thick books written about them which you know I love I love all the details like I said that's what I loved about this book is if you were just going by the news reports and articles about this case so many facts mishmashed together I really did appreciate that this sort of you know laid it all out and was like no, no no this this is what happened and it was nice getting a little bit more background into Grant and Laura's relationship I really appreciated that again 
Wish I could have had more about Laura and Grant's upbringing, but it was, it was a good book. And if you're, yeah, really want to know a lot more about this case, I, you know, recommend reading the book. Alrighty, y'all. I guess I will let you go. Hope the, the rainy sounds and the splashy sounds aren't too much of a burden. I hope you have a wonderful two weeks. Stay safe and happy and healthy out there. And remember, dude, don't be a dick. Like, for the love of God, don't be like Grant and Amanda. Don't be a user. Don't be an abuser, a manipulator. Just don't be a waste of human space, all right? Be better. Do better. And just spread kindness when you go out there, you know? Alrighty, y'all. Take care. I will see you next month. Bye-bye.